is Quebec and Ontario and ultimately end here at the finish line next to City Hall in Ottawa as we welcome you on what is, should be a warm morning it presently 14 degrees Celsius just after 6.30 in the morning Eastern time. The conditions are expected to be a factor. We will get into that as the day goes on and uh, hello and welcome. Uh, Thank you for joining us here on what should be a terrific Sunday in our nation's capital. Arash Madani alongside Olympian Krista Duchesne, Rob Walker, who has covered so many and called so many Olympic marathons. And what a weekend it has been already. You two were on the call of the 10K yesterday. We saw a couple of Olympians dueling on the men's side, Canadian Olympians dueling on the men's side. And this should be a terrific race here this morning. Really looking forward to this. I, I think the 10K set the platform perfectly last night, Arash. Krista and I really enjoyed the, the gutsy, brave solo front running of Natasha Wodak. And as for the duel in the sun, which is how it will become known, Cam Levins and Mo Ahmed laid on a fabulous display. Two great North American distance runners, two great world-level distance runners, and Mo Ahmed is in tip-top shape, ready for the Budapest World Championships. He ran brilliantly to win that. I said it last night, and I'll say it again. This is the race weekend to be at. We've got the two and the 5K that was yesterday, and the 10K and the marathon and half marathon today. And for Canadians, this is the weekend that you don't want to miss. So it's great to be here. The course route is a little different this year than it has been in previous, and we will talk about that as the day unfolds. But this is going to be an interesting way for the runners to to go about it. We are grateful for the opportunity to host these events on these beautiful lands surrounding and its tribute. Tartan Ottawa International Marathon starts downtown, just blocks away from Canada's Parliament Hill. The course begins on Elgin Street, where it winds past the Canadian War Memorial, honoring those who lost their lives in service for Canada. From there, the route turns on to the Rideau Canal, which weaves through the heart of Canada's capital. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Rideau Canal Skateway in the winter becomes a treasure that is the pride of the city. After leaving Dow's Lake, the race moves through Ottawa's Little Italy, which is full of restaurants and authentic shops. From there, the runners turn on to the soon-to-be-renamed Ottawa River Parkway, running adjacent to the historic river. The Tartan Ottawa International Marathon is unique that it takes place in two Canadian provinces. Participants leave Ontario, they visit the province of Quebec, and will run through parts of beautiful Gatineau Park. That park is the second most visited one in Canada after Banff in Alberta. And Gatineau Park is a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts as countless recreational and leisure activities are accessible there. Departing Quebec, the course moves over the Alexandra Bridge back into Ontario where it passes the National Gallery of Canada and then heads along Sussex Drive towards Rideau Hall, the home of the Governor General. From there, the race moves along the Sir George Etienne Cartier Parkway, winding its way through the neighborhoods of Rockcliffe and Manor Park and New Edinburgh. By the 38 kilometer mark, the course loops back towards the Byward Market. That's a historic and popular spot in Ottawa, featuring great shopping and markets and restaurants right in the core of the city. And then comes the final stretch of the course. Back to the Rideau Canal on Colonel By Drive, before turning onto the home stretch on Queen Elizabeth Drive. And that's where thousands of spectators will cheer racers through to the finish line. And it was on that course a year ago where history was made. A course record from the Ethiopian Andu Alam Shefara, who ran it in 20604. That four years after the women's record was shattered and the question today becomes on a new course can we see history get repeated in ottawa in 2023 well it's an interesting one that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question i mean i'm curious about gadsi uh, shumi because he's run inside 205 this season however when you look back on his running cv 
every other marathon he's run, he's done well, but he's been outside 210. So he's taken a sudden and phenomenal step up in class to join the sub 205 club. It's possible the conditions are good. It might get a little too warm for those who are further back down the field as, the, as we edge towards 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. But for the elites, this weather shouldn't be too much of a problem. It's just interesting to see whether he can replicate what he did in Seville. If he can, yes, we have a potential event record. We wouldn't be allowed to call it a course record because owing to the construction in the city, the course changes from 9 to 20K. So it's not going to be run on exactly the same course that we had last year, but we would still be able to call it an event record. But what do you think about Shumi? It's hard to see, isn't it? We, it'll be fascinating to see how those first few kilometers unfold. Definitely. On the women's side, I'm looking forward to following Malat Kajeda. We were talking about this before, where she hasn't run a lot of marathons, but when she did, she did well. Sixth at the Tokyo Olympics, and then sixth in Berlin in 2019, and then she was second in the World Half Marathon Championships in 2020. So with this only being her third marathon, I think we can expect to see a good performance from her today. Yeah, and what a story Kajeda is. She was born in Ethiopia, has emigrated to Germany. She ran, finished sixth in Tokyo, didn't know at the time that she was pregnant at those <laughs> Olympic Games. This is her first marathon since returning from Japan and becoming a mother for the first time. This is one of the biggest race weekends you'll find anywhere. And the director of the operation is with our Derek Fage. Derek. Oh, my goodness. It is the big day. I was going to say in the big race, but yesterday's 10K was also an incredible race. I am joined by Ian Fraser. And Ian, wow, um, this is when I think uh, everything comes together for you. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. We woke up this morning after about three hours sleep, ready to go. So we're, we're super excited this morning. Let's talk about yesterday. Um, you know, what an incredible race. And I don't think any big surprises, but how did you feel about yesterday's uh, Canadian championship? Um, no, no big surprises. Uh, what a great race between Mo and Cam. Fantastic. And listening to Mo speak at the finish line was absolutely incredible. What, what a class act and what a, what a great day for us. Amazing. And Natasha winning as well. Um, no real surprise there, but just so good. We've talked about this before. Uh, a lot of work goes into this, Ian. Just yeah. describe to everybody that's watching now how much work. I know that, you know, as soon as this race is done, you guys start again. We start again. You know, um, it's a full full 12 month of the year program. Uh, we've got a couple of thousand volunteers to organize. We have all of the infrastructure to put in place and all of the planning for that participant experience stuff, which is super important. And it's just, you know, we'll we'll take a day off and then we'll get back to work. <laughs> uh, a little bit of a change to the route this year. Uh, tell us uh, what, what, what changes were made. Yeah, so we're spending a little more time on the Gatineau side this year. Um, we've got a great partnership with the city of Gatineau and it, I think it really shows the flavor of the cross-border piece here in Ottawa and the whole region. I think it's amazing. We've chosen some routing that'll be, I think, beautiful near the river. Um, I think it's going to be awesome. What, do you, what would you like to tell everybody that's, you know, all those fans lining up cheering on these runners uh that was pretty special yesterday it'll probably be even more special today it'll be more special today it's a longer day for everybody so give them some love they're really going to need it out there today it's going to be a little warm but thankfully it's not going to be quite as warm as we thought it was going to be a couple of days ago so it's looking to be warm but i wouldn't call it super hot today so we're good uh, final thoughts to your team that helped you put this together. Uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I, it's too early in the morning to start crying, right? Um, I am so fortunate to be working with a group of people that I work with. They are so good. Um, they're just kind. They love what we do. They just absolutely love it. And uh, it couldn't be any better. You're going to join us for that celebration show. That's when the tears come for that big celebration show we've got coming up. Oh, I'll be there for that. Oh, I'll bring my box of Kleenex and I'll be ready to roll. Looking forward to it. Hey, have a great day. Uh, we'll, we'll catch up to you at the celebration show. Cool. Thanks, Thank Derek. You, Appreciate it. All right. I'll, back to you, Arash. Derek, Ian, thank you so much. It's important to note, this is an elite competition, but last year more than a million dollars was raised for national and local charities from this entire race weekend and this marathon is the culmination of it, the sixth event of the entire Tamarack race weekend. Um, the Canadians just figure always in this event somehow, some way. Last year, you know, 
the race winner. And to me, Melinda Elmore becomes one of the stories of this entire competition. 43 years young. In 2004, was an Olympian. In the 1500 meters in Tokyo, she ran the marathon. And Derek also, a little earlier, caught up with Elmore. Well, a lot of elite athletes, of course, joining us here at the Tamarack Ottawa Race Weekend. And one of those elite athletes is Melindy Elmore. Melindy, how are you feeling going into this race? I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be a great race. And any time I get to run in Canada is such a joy. Have you been here before? Have you raced at uh, Ottawa Race Weekend? I ran the 10K in 2019. So it's been four years. And of course, a lot has changed since then. Um, tell me about the season so far leading up to this race. So I, I ran in uh, Japan a month ago and ran a personal best in the half marathon. So I'm pretty optimistic that I'm on course for a good race this weekend. Um, with the marathon and the long distance races, we don't get too many opportunities to race. You only race a few every few months. So each each opportunity is is taken pretty seriously and it's a pretty special opportunity. Have you set a personal goal for yourself? Yes, um, I would love to qualify for the Paris Olympics at this race, which is by running 226.50 or faster. Um, however, the weather may make it a little bit more challenging. Um, so if, if that time doesn't make sense because you run a little bit slower and the hotter it gets, um, then it's just to run a really strong race. And I, I like finishing a race knowing that I really truly did my best and left it all out there and, and you can't really ask for anything more. Yeah, looking at the weather, what, what is ideal? I mean, when you looked ahead and you saw what the weather was like here, I mean, you just talked about it, right? You might have to slow down. What's ideal weather and, and why, why, why would you be concerned about, you know, the, the heat in this particular race? Yeah, so last weekend would have been ideal weather. <laughs> so let's just move things back a week. Um, for the marathon, about 9 or 10 degrees is actually the ideal temperature. So we're, we're starting off maybe 14 or 15, but the humidity is also fairly high or it's forecasted to be high. So you look at, like, the Humidex charts at um, the, the temperature and the humidity combine what that does and it, for every few degrees um, you need to adjust by about three seconds a kilometer for, for your race pace and that actually adds up to several minutes over the course of, of a full marathon. Incredible. Um, really wish you the best of luck. Thanks so much for doing this with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. All right, Derek, thanks. Last year in Toronto, Elmore finished fourth in the marathon there was the top Canadian. And it's interesting as we talk about conditions, Elmore ran into some issues in Seville. At the 26 kilometer mark, she just pulled the chute. She said, I just came out of the gate way too fast. I didn't have a lot of sleep. I was dealing with some jet lag. And her point to us this week, she said, I'm quoting here, I have to respect the conditions and I have to be willing to adjust my kilometer pace and my overall goal. Right. And, you know, it's difficult when you have to do that, because if you have a certain level of fitness, um, you want to show that. But right. You can learn the hard way. And Melindy knows that she's not going to do that. So uh, looking at her Strava, she looked to be about 223, 24 fitness. So that should help her today. And she is an amazing story. You mentioned that she ran at the Olympics in 20, 2004 and she just missed it by a second in 2008 and 2012. And then she moved up and did the Ironman mm -hmm. at distance. And of course, that's phenomenal. Had a few kids and then stepped down to the marathon. So I remember you know, back when she was starting to run the marathon, I thought, okay, a 1500 meter runner who's done the Ironman coming down to the marathon, we are going to see this woman do well in Canada. And she's sure proven that. Hold on, hold on. She stepped down to the marathon. She right. went from yeah. Ironman she to doesn't stepping have the, down the to the swim marathon. swim and the bike before right. today. So. What a slacker. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think it's a really good story because I get the impression from Melindy that those years after stepping away from the 1500 allowed her not only to concentrate on being a, a, a young mum with, with three children, but it also allowed her to rekindle the very passion she had for right. running that made her start in the sport to begin with. And that's why I think she's still able to perform at such a high level at the age of 43, because she had that time away and now appreciates being back there. Mentally, I think she's pretty strong. And I don't think it's a bad sign that she dropped out in Seville at the 26K marker because every marathon she's finished a rash, mm -hmm. she's run really well. And perhaps that was a little bit of wise head on the shoulders just saying, OK, this isn't quite going well, but there are other chances later this year. 
My goal is to run 2.26.50. I want to be on the plane for Paris. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what she might do today. Melendi Elmore is going to be one of the Canadians to watch on the women's side. On the men's side, Lee Wasalius didn't expect to be running in this marathon. He was on the line in Vienna earlier this spring, and he pulled the shoot there. So the Canadian from New Brunswick is going to be in the mix with the elite men. But it is the Ethiopians that we are going to have our eyes on throughout the morning and uh last year was an ethiopian who ended up winning it setting an event record and here we go again yes gachi shumi is the fastest in the field on paper we've touched on that 204 59 from seville but we have to wait and see whether he can do it again that was his only sub 210. abdi ali gelchu is an interesting athlete because he came through the second half of the race very quickly last year to finish second so he's got some experience here in ottawa and i also can't wait to see how felix kibitok runs on the basis of his half marathon pb at 5908 in prague a few years ago he should be and could be running a lot quicker than his marathon PB, which was set in Barcelona last year, 2.06.28. So curious to see how the only Kenyan in the race goes. Abraha is a 2.06 man. He was fourth in Dubai. Banti, another good athlete, 2.06.23, but only 2.11 in Mumbai earlier this year. And the subplot here, we need to keep our eye on the Japanese yeah, this is a good one. athletes because we've got 11 of them here. They have an end of May cutoff to just to get into their Olympic trial race later this year. Now, some of them will need to run 208. The, the, the name of the game here is if they've only got one performance to rely on, they need 208 or better just to get into the Olympic trials. If, for instance, they've run a 2090, they can afford to run a 2.11.0 here because the Japanese selectors have said they need, if they can't run 2.08, they can spread their qualification over two performances, but the average of those two performances has to be 2.10 or better. So we've got quite a few of them who need to run low 2.09s. One or two of them have got a good performance, but not quite under 2.08. They can afford to run a 2.11. We will keep you posted on how that goes. This is their last chance to qualify for the Olympic trial later this year. And that's why 11 of them have come. And this is what I've discovered this week, that after baseball and soccer, marathon running is the number three sport in Japan. The last Japanese winner in Ottawa, 2010, Arata Fujiwara. On the women's side, we talked about Melendi Elmore being the Canadian to watch. He's right there in the middle of your screen. A number of Americans in the mix, but... You have three Ethiopians and an Ethiopian born now representing Germany at the top of the table. Right. I think the top four there, we will get to see them lead the race today. Uh, Cam Levins, who we know ran the 10K last night and was second place, is going to be pacing this lead group at about 222. So that's going to be Melissa, Makasha, and Kumela. And then uh, right behind them at about a 223 pace, we have uh, Kajeta, who's going to be, you know, she might be in the mix with them eventually. And then, of course, we know we've got Melindy Almore, who's going after the standard uh, to be named to the Olympic team for Paris and she is going to be paced by Patty Birch and Kevin Coffey today. And then the Americans that we see there, they are trying to get their standard to run at their Olympic trials. You see Melissa there at the top of your screen. She was a silver medalist in Seville in February. She turns 30 this September. That was a personal best in Seville, by the way, 221. 54. So many people are responsible for putting this Tartan Ottawa Marathon together. One of them is with our Derek Fage in an interview from just a little earlier. Dylan Weeks is the elite athletes coordinator and of course some of the best uh, top runners the entire world come to this race weekend. Uh, it's going to be an exciting one. First of all, Dylan, uh, tell me about what it looks like this year. You know, it's we're post-pandemic and we're starting to see some of those elites come back to Ottawa. It's exciting times for us, isn't it? It is really exciting and absolutely this year I feel like everything is really back. You know, our elites are um, from Kenya, Ethiopia, Germany, the United States, and of course here in Canada. So we have also have a big contingent from Japan. So it's really going to be uh, an exciting year. 
Who should we look out for on the women's side? Yeah, on the women's side, uh, Malek Kajida, she represents Germany. Uh, she's originally from Ethiopia, and she was sixth place in the Tokyo Olympic Marathon. Uh, an impressive woman. She's now a mother uh, to a one-year-old child, and this will be her first marathon after giving childbirth. We're really excited to see what she can do. Uh, and then Melindy Elmore, our, our Canadian favorite. Melindy was ninth in the Tokyo Olympics, so she is in great form. She's going to be looking to qualify, uh, run a time that will qualify her for the Paris Olympics in 2024. So really excited for both of them. Uh, let's move over to the men's side. Who should we be looking out for over there? The men's is pretty wide open. We've got a couple strong athletes from Ethiopia. One, uh, Gadisa Shumi, has run two hours and four minutes for the marathon. Our course record is two hours and six minutes. So I'm hopeful if the if the weather is good and, and he's feeling good on the day that he's going to take a shot at that course record. And I think there will be uh, three or four others, including Felix Kabitak from Kenya, who will, will give up... Uh, you know, give them a good fight out there. And then we also have a contingent of 11 athletes from Japan who are looking to run a time that will qualify them for their Olympic trials, which take place early next year. Uh, so it's, you know, the marathon in Japan is a huge thing. It's a huge spectacle. The thousands of people go out to watch their marathon races there. So for these guys to come here to try and qualify for their Olympic trials is, is a huge thing. So we're excited to see, see how they do as well. You mentioned the weather, uh, looking ahead and seeing what the weather might look like for that marathon, half marathon. As an elite running yourself, is it is it good weather? What do you think these athletes are thinking? It's going to be a little bit warmer and more humid than is ideal uh, but we start at 7 a.m. so that's a good thing in terms of it not getting too hot you know these runners will be done by 9 9 30 um, so it's probably not ideal but it's it's not terrible either so I still expect really good competition people might have to have maybe a little bit different strategy uh, de depending on how hot it actually does get but uh, you know weather's always a little bit of a factor in the Ottawa Marathon that that the elites have to take into consideration and and this, this year is no different than for that. Always appreciate, appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Dylan. Enjoy race weekend. Yeah, thanks, guys. Derek Dillon, thank you. This is a live look at the starting line just beside Ottawa City Hall. The participants getting ready. All right, Krista, in the, in the moments leading up to the, to the gun going off, what are the nerves, what are the emotions at this stage of things at such a prestigious competition? Yeah, you know, it's the moment you've been waiting for. You've been training for months, you know, through some grueling winter weather. And, you know, now's the time to shine. So, you know, I think it's important to think about your your goal and what you want to get out of it. Uh, you want to stay calm and not get let the nerves get the best of you. So in the beginning, it's easy to start off a little bit fast, but usually after that first kilometer, you can start to settle into a rhythm. But um, it's also thinking about preparing yourself um, to do the best you can do in the race, including keeping cool, which we know that it's not as hot as we thought it would be, but um, it certainly is just as exciting. With the new course, the organizers have a slight incline at the beginning, and then it's pretty flat for the next 5 or 6K. They want the runners to get into a rhythm. It's going to be pretty flat through the Pretoria Bridge. It'll be fascinating to see how they cope with the slightly new course. I mean, certainly when you look at the likes of Abdi Ali Gelchu, who's got the experience of having come through so quickly in the second half of the race 12 months ago, you know, I wonder whether these little tweaks will be will make the course slightly slower or slightly faster i mean we heard from dylan weiss there who's such a great ambassador for for canadian distance running on paper if shumi can replicate uh, what he did in seville then there is a chance of a new course record but that was a pretty special performance that low 206s last year i think i think we're looking forward to a great race and an event record would be a bonus but I always remember I, I haven't run marathons as quickly as Krista, but at the front, of course, you just want to get going for the thousands of other club runners and fun runners and fundraisers and people setting themselves goals to lose weight. You're so excited before the start of the marathon. You just can't wait to get going. And I hope they I hope they remember the most important thing, because when you've been training for the marathon, you've been going through the gears, getting your body used to running on tired legs. But if you've done your tapering correctly over the final two weeks, two and a half weeks, your legs have never felt fresher because you've got so used to running, feeling fatigued, 
that in those last two weeks, all you do is rest. And my goodness me, when you start and the adrenaline surges and you take those first few strides, you feel like you're floating. And that's the time where, from a club runner's point of view, you can get sucked into going a little bit too fast, a little bit too hard too early. So I hope they remember to keep their adrenaline and their enthusiasm under control because it's a long old way. Yeah, it happens to the best of them. The elites have talked about that, that coming out of the gate, they come out a little too strong and then they realize they've hit a wall too. Right. And I think for the experienced runners, they can expect that. So it's often a good idea to look at your your splits over 5K markers instead of each kilometer because, you know, it usually balances out once you get into that rhythm and have a little, you know, hills and, and whatnot. So they'll they'll be aware that the first kilometer can, you know, easily be a bit too quick, especially for, for some races that start with a bit of a downhill. It can really seem too fast, but they'll settle in. And that's absolutely the case with London because the first 5K with London, London Marathon, is ever so slightly downhill and when you add when you add that descent into the adrenaline into the fresh legs it's so easy to overcook london early on we talk about the conditions and the heat potentially being a factor it was interesting at the technical meeting yesterday with some of the runners some were talking about those who have really trained indoors on a treadmill may have a little bit more of an advantage because they're just used to the overheating and that was something that i hadn't heard before Right. It's a little bit difficult when you live in Canada and we've got winter weather to try to prepare your body for the heat that you can expect. But there are some things that you can do training on a treadmill, wearing extra layers of clothing, you know, running at noon instead of first thing in the morning, make use of a sauna, hot tub, that kind of thing. And I know Melindy Elmore, again, looking at her Strava, we, we can track runners and their, their progress. She's been doing a bit of that to prepare herself today uh, for this race. And it's something that she did with Natasha Wodak when they were preparing for the Tokyo Olympics with it right. was in Sapporo they they were really uh tuned into the the details to to uh prepare for the heat yeah Wodak who won the 10k yesterday set a Canadian marathon record in Berlin last year as we are now inside two minutes before the start of this Tartan Ottawa marathon uh let's go around the table Rob what are you looking for today I'm looking to see how well Felix Kibitok runs. I mentioned he's got a PB of mid-206s, which he set in Barcelona, but he's a low 59-minute man for the half marathon. He's the only Kenyan that's come here, and he hasn't traveled all this way to be a passenger behind a load of Ethiopians. So I'm curious to see how he will go. And I'm also interested to see how well Kajeta can bounce back from becoming a mother and bearing in mind it's only her third marathon. It's a tough field. She's not the quickest woman in, in the race on paper. Fascinating to see how her first half of the race unfolds. Krista? Yeah, I'm in the same. Uh, looking forward to seeing her as well. It's, of course, you know, Melinda Elmore. We, we want to follow our Canadian athletes, and she's going for that Olympic standard. Like she said in the interview before, she knows it's going to be challenging with the conditions, but she'll be smart. She's got the support of the pacers around her who were the same men that helped her uh, running the Toronto. Uh, marathon previously. Elmore also has the family here. She has her one son. Yeah, her other son came to Toronto and they kind of, you know, made it fair. She told me the story that he he picked the trip or Legos. And so it was nice that her little guy got to come and he's going to be five soon. So he's here with his dad, uh, Graham Hood, who's also Melindy's coach and uh, an Olympian himself. Under 30 seconds to go before the start of the marathon, the final race from Tamarack, Ottawa race weekend. You see the elite runners there, Melindy Elmore second to the left, to the left, Parker Stinson of the USA beside her. We have waited a year for this, the start of the marathon, now in our nation's capital. start of this marathon as we mentioned not far from Ottawa City Hall there is a slight incline at the beginning but for the first five or six K it's pretty flat and this is where you see the incline here and this is uh, this is by design 
the organizers want the runners to get into a rhythm. They want them to find their pace. We have a number of uh, pace setters here, and there, there's an aggressive mindset here from some of these African runners. A lot of the African runners who are pacing are making their way up to hopefully be the ones that are going to be paced uh, eventually. So it's it's a great opportunity for them to earn a little bit of money and to prepare for, you know, where they hope to be. So you can see that they're out front here, just kind of looking at their watches and, and trying to make sure that, that those they are pacing are, are close to them. And uh, it's really handy with the bibs. They've got to pacer on the front so that we know who they are when we call the race. And then on the back, I believe they have have the pace that they are to be working at so that the runners can be looking for that and getting the appropriate pacer. Uh, in this particular race, uh, it, they have been instructed to, uh, they would not uh, like them to finish the race. And that's always something, uh, a bit of a discussion, where in some races, um, they do allow the pacers to continue to run to the end of the race. So it's everyone has different feelings and, and opinions about that. But I think uh, what's important is that people know what the rules are going into it. So sometimes you can expect they will finish the race. And other times, in this case, they, they are instructed not to. And, that's, and, and the pacemakers not being in a major championship marathon is why those races are so different and so intriguing, because it's never about the times, it's about the gold, silver and bronze. The subplot we were talking about with the Japanese is an interesting one. And just, I've spotted one of the Japanese, it's Akiro Kaneko, who's just on the left of picture with the red vest. Now he needs to run 208, there he is, great work by the camera team there. Kaneko needs to run 208.21 because the marathon he's currently got, remember, they take the average times across two and it has to be quicker than 2.10. His marathon time from Osaka last year was 2.11.39. So, as we say in Britain, it's Monte Carlo or bust for Kaneko. There's no point in him running 2.10. That doesn't get him in the Japanese Olympic trials for Paris. He has to produce 2.08.21, and that is why he is right up behind the pacemakers, setting his stall out early, going all guns for glory. The two top pacemakers are at 2.06 and 2.08. Kaneko is in the group that's 2.08, but he's coming out hot out of the gate. We'll be, we'll be talking about the Japanese runners. If you missed it earlier, there are 11 who have made the trip over to Ottawa, hoping to qualify for the Olympic trials. The cutoff for the Japanese Olympic trials is May 31st. It is a very difficult trial, a very prestigious trial to get into. The standards are much harder over there. 29 women have qualified already. There will be millions of Japanese watching in October at their Olympic trials. Marathon running is just enormous over in Japan, and so this really matters for these Japanese runners. Yes, I wa was in Tokyo in March, um, completing my, my sixth major, and boy, do they put on an event, and um, they take it seriously. So this is definitely, you know, kind of the hockey for us in Canada. The marathon is something for sure that runners will be tuning into, so we can expect to have some viewers today from, from Japan. One other athlete I've uh, just noticed that we haven't really spoken about in the lead up to the start of the race, he's in that lead group as well, is Adane, who won Barcelona last year with 205.53. He's got a decent track pedigree, made the top six of the World Juniors back in 2014, over 10,000 metres. He's run 14 marathons and he's won his last two, not only Barcelona, but he came here to Canada and won in Toronto with 207. He hasn't raced yet in 2023, and I just wonder, the fact that we know he can perform well here in Canada, the fact that he's on a winning run, and he's got that former track pedigree, seven podiums in 14 marathons, he is definitely a factor. We haven't mentioned him up to now, but let's just put his name out there in these very early stages, because he is quietly going about his business uh, in that lead group behind those two pacemakers. Top 40 in the world ranking, Yehulahan Adani is only 27 years old from Ethiopia. Rob, you mentioned he won the Toronto Marathon last October. He ran away with it, really. 207.18. It, it was such an interesting race last fall. They were a pack of seven at the halfway point. 
And then in the final 10K, it was Adani who just took over and won by a little over a minute. Two pace makers, Vincent Ngetic and Peter Njeru, just uh, checking their watches, making sure that the lead group behind them are attached, which they are, and Koneko is like a shadow behind the two pacemakers. Set a PB over the half marathon, Koneko, 62.07, that was in February, second in the Gold Coast last year, but it's not about the positions for him, it's about 2.08.21. And if we see other Japanese athletes up towards the front, we'll also give you the, the numbers on what they have to run to come home with this aggregate of 2.10.00 or better to get into their trials. It's been great to have Brett Larner here, um, who's a Canadian who actually lives in Japan. At the technical meeting, he was able to translate to the athletes, you know, with 11 of them being here, he wants to make sure that they're informed about what's to happen today. And um, he, he will for sure be tracking. It was great for him to explain to us, um, you know, the, the system that we talked about for them qualifying. Camera's just focused in on Adane, and we got a glimpse of Felix Kibitok, the 31-year-old lone Kenyan in this race. He's, he's quite a charming guy, actually, quite mild-mannered. I said to him in, uh, in the, the athletes' uh, green room, it's like their, their chill-out area in the, uh, in the athlete hotel, I said, oh, you, you're on your own flying the flag for the Kenyans. He said, ah, oh, I'll do my best. A little wry smile on his face. So he's uh, comfortably in that lead group, as you'd expect at the moment. He's from Nandi County, Kenya. Turns 32 in a couple of weeks. Uh, Kibitov grew up in a family of farmers, small scale farmers. And he said he got into running to help the family, help them have a better life. And he's actually used some of his prize money to pay for further education for some of his siblings. That's definitely a common story that we we hear. We have a few splits, um, of course, as we expected. The first kilometer was a bit fast at about 251, and then the second kilometer we have at 303. So definitely a big difference there, and they'll be settling in. We'll be talking about the elites throughout the morning, but let's remember there are a lot of people. More than 30,000 who have descended upon our national capital to run this marathon, perhaps checking something off their bucket list. Perhaps this is part of their annual routine, running the full marathon. The half actually begins in a couple of hours' time. And it really is amazing. These drone shots, these overhead shots, just seeing the swarms of people out on the streets, uh, getting to something that they've been preparing for for months and finally getting that opportunity. Oh, this is, without any question, these runners, or the ones we just saw a second or so ago, they're the beating part of this event. And I was interested, looking at the stats and the facts and the figures, 200,000 people coming out on the streets of Ottawa every year to, to cheer on the 10K on the Saturday night, the children's run, all the half marathon or the marathon, but 14 million Canadian dollars are pumped into this city's economy yeah. as a result of this event every year. And it's not just the money, it's the fact that we get great images like this. I mean, this is a, I can say this as an outsider, this is an utterly stunning city. It's a fabulous place. Whatever hotel you're put in by the race organizers, I've been lucky enough to be coming here for a few years now. Wherever you walk, there's great architecture, great culture, and very, very friendly people. This is a brilliant advert for the city, it really is. For a lot of people, this is a, a destination where, you know, runners plan and train and, and build their schedule around a marathon where they can go to a city, um, have the race, and then take a couple of days to, to vacation, enjoy the food and the culture. So I'm sure that's the case for a lot of people today who are in our nation's capital. Um, you know, not just Canadians, but obviously other international athletes. Uh, I'm not sure if the Japanese have some trips planned. Often they, they come and they want to see Toronto and Niagara Falls and they won't likely make it out to the to BC or, or you know Vancouver Island but um, they might make a little trip when they're here 
We're past the 10 minute mark of this 2023 Tartan Ottawa Marathon. And, and you talk about this race, and you talk about what everybody's gone through over the last few years. In 2022, it was the first return to racing for this marathon for the race weekend. But among the elite marathon runners, there were a number who could not get into the country with visa issues and the rest, but it is full go. 2023 is a full return to competition. Yeah, that was really um, difficult and upsetting, I think, for Dylan Wikes last year, having uh, done so much work as the elite coordinator and then the problem with the, the visas and the athletes coming. But, you know, you make the best of it. You hear lots of stories of athletes who their luggage doesn't come and, you know, they sleep at the airport or they, they do, you know, different things to try to just make their flight to come and, and make the best of it. That's uh, something with the Africans. They they tend to be a bit more relaxed when life throws them some curveballs. So um, that's something that's, you know, interesting stories to sometimes hear though that. On the right side of your screen, the lead women. And on the left, the lead men. Uh, we, we've talked about Melinda Elmore in the open, the Canadian, 43 years old, been to a couple of Olympic Games. Melinda has her sights set on Paris next summer for her third career Olympics. Yeah, and, you know, what an incredible story if she can say that she she returns to the Olympics, you know, that many years after her first um, she could probably write a book. So right there we see Cam Levins. He's wearing white today. Last night he was wearing red when he was uh, in the 10K up with uh, Mohamed. So he is pacing the, the lead group of women today. Uh, they wanted to go out at about 222 pace. And again, that's going to be Melissa, Nakasha, and Kumela that we expect to see in that group. Um, but it looks like we've got a few more in there potentially. And we also get some men who join the group too, which um, which can make it a little bit tricky to identify. Well, and, and also we had a funny feeling that this might happen, Krista, because Malat Kajeta had specifically asked for 223, right. where Cam Levins was asked to provide 222. Now, as Dylan Weeks pointed out at one of the technical meetings, that's only a difference of one second per kilometer. So it was almost inevitable, really. He, he had a gut instinct that the 223 pace group and the 222 grade pace group would basically just be one big lump, and that's exactly what you're seeing there. Definitely want to be running in a group um, this early in the race. That's the pace setter, Cam Levins of British Columbia. He ran the 10K yesterday, as we talked about before. Bronze medalist at the 2014 Commonwealth Games. Had the best Canadian finish ever, a fourth at the 2022 World Championships in Oregon. He set a Canadian record there. He is the pace setter for the lead women's group of this Ottawa Marathon. noticed that the two pacemakers talking about the men's race on the left and get and jerry they had just begun to open up a little bit of a gap on the lead group it was only about five or six meters but they've obviously slowed a little bit and allowed that group to reattach which is important because oh, well, yeah, pacemakers have to use their there. discretion you know they yeah, no if they're asked to produce a certain pace that's one thing but if they look around yeah, like and those they are pacing are not with them. They have to be able to use common sense and think, okay, well, maybe this is a little too fast. We have to drop back and pick them up again, and I'm glad to see that they've done that. Right, Dylan mentioned that in the technical meeting yesterday, that that's, the, you know, the pacer's job to, to read the group because they're not, you know, going to benefit the group if they're 50 metres ahead and they're just sticking to the, the, to the clock and being a little bit too diligent to their duties. That was good running. I just this is an unofficial split because I just saw them going through 5k. They're, they're inside, they're inside course record pace at the moment, and maybe it was a little, maybe it was even a little brisker than that, which is why uh, the pacemakers 
have just eased off a fraction and allowed that group to reattach on the left. And then the women are a little bit slower than what they wanted to start out at. Uh, they're at about 2.23, uh, 24 pace, so a little bit more of a conservative start. So uh, he'll he'll do a good job on the uh, on the pacemaking duties, that's for sure. He's uh, preparing for the Canadian Half Marathon Championships that will be in June. So this will be a, a pretty solid uh, weekend of training for his his build toward that. Mulisa, wearing the white vest, is just behind Makesha. Makesha in red, behind the other pacemaker helping Cam Levin. So. Makesha ran that 2.22.45 in Dubai a few years ago. Mulisa is the fastest in the field on paper, second in Seville earlier this year. She's running in that white vest. So the, uh, the main protagonists are right there. Mulisa of Ethiopia, Makesha of Ethiopia, and Kajeta, the former Ethiopian who now represents Germany, coming back from childbirth, those three right there in that group behind a very comfortable looking Cam Levins. We see Makesha there in the red. She has a top eight major marathon finish on the resume. That was in Chicago last year. You mentioned the performance of Dubai Rob in 2019, 2.22.45. That is a personal best for her there. Um, she ran the Dubai Marathon in February. She ran 2.27. 25 so being in the pace group of 222 is a significant uh, significant jump for her compared to earlier this year oh, a mad dash there to, to grab uh, their their bottles and um, it's it's key to get your bottles early in the race you don't want to miss any of them uh, if you do you can pick up uh, just kind of one of the the general bottles that would be provided but uh, every athlete will have their solution with their electrolytes and carbohydrate mix to work for their um, their body their stomach their energy all those things and definitely staying hydrated is going to be key today so um, it, it's worth it at this point to kind of dodge back a bit if you need to make sure that you get that bottle well, and, and speaking of that, what an extraordinary way for Sifan Hassan to win the London Marathon. Even as late as about 39 or 40 K, she completely checked her stride, went sideways to pick up a bottle, and was then feeling good enough, she offered to share that bottle, I can't remember who <laughs> with, um, as she ran up towards the finish. That was an incredible marathon in London. So yes, they, you know, even Olympic champions like Sifan Hassan, I know that was her marathon, marathon debut, uh, they don't always make those transitions to pick up the water bottles look as um, look as effortless as they could be. So we're through the first six kilometers or so with the lead men, and the wind comes from the west, so it's around the parkways that they get a little more exposed here, and we're being told it's a pretty windy day out there on the track. How does that now affect how they approach this next little stretch? Well, with pacers and being in a group, you can take it advantage of that and tuck behind someone. Of course, if they're taller and a bit bigger, that can work and, and help you. But, um, you know, one thing to note, you may have um, the headwind and a tailwind, but it doesn't equal out. So basically, um, you're going to be more harmed by the headwind and not gain that back with the tailwind. So, uh, you know, ideal conditions, seven degrees, no humidity, no wind, that kind of thing, but you often don't get that. So it's playing it smart, again, tucking behind and, and moving out when uh, you've got that tailwind behind you. Just a, just a few hints here. There's Felix Kivitok, Banty, we haven't mentioned too much about him, 206 in Prague, but only that uh, 211 in Mumbai. Just again, tiny hint that the pacers perhaps going ever so slightly too quickly in 
inside 206. There's Felix Kibitok, I think that's a good spot on the, uh, on the curb there with Abrahma. Uh, just behind him, Abrahma, who ran low 206 last year in October and in Dubai when he finished fourth, the former world junior silver medalist over 10,000 metres back in 2010. Talking about the figure on the left there, running next to Felix Kivitok. Both look pretty comfortable. Gelchu on the left, tall figure. He was runner-up last year. He was a long way behind the winner and course record holder, Schifferall, who ran that 2.06.04, but he came through very quickly. The one I'm looking for is Shumi. Now, Shumi isn't in that group. And remember, uh, we were talking to Arash just before the race began. The question on Shumi, even though he ran that sub-205 in Seville, was the fact that it was a one-off wonderful performance where every one of his other marathons has been a 210, a 212, a 213. Right. Races like Riga and Zagreb. I don't think he's in that group. And, and Although this pace is solid, you would absolutely expect him to be there if he was going to be a contender. So the fastest man in the field, unless I'm missing something, the fastest man in the field is not in that group, and that means he's already been dropped. Well, you think about it, Shumi, who won Montreal last September, he ran it in 2.09.25. That was the first time he'd run under 2.10 in his career. So you think to yourself, okay, you do 209, then you run Seville in 20459. Are you on to something? Maybe that was a little bit of a mirage rob, as you mentioned. Lead men coming up on the Dow's Lake area in Ottawa, and this is where the wind is expected to pick up a little bit. there for the elite women. Kajeta just at the back of that group. Remember Kajeta coming back from having a baby. She's running in only her third marathon. And Makesha in the red vest. She's run 12 marathons and one Singapore. Six podiums. There's Makesha. Just towards this side of the elite group running behind Cam Levins and they should be reasonably comfortable at the moment. What is it? 223s, 224s at the moment. Look at the pacemakers again in the elite men's race. They're, 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 des they're just edging away and then, they, and then they allow the group to come back. This is pretty quick. this a few times when I've come here to Ottawa and it's worth saying it again because it's a great indication as to the pride that people have in the city here. You hardly ever see any litter in this city. Hardly ever. It, it, it really does. I know that sounds like a strange thing to say, but it, it's. I always think it's indicative of how proud people are of their area when they themselves keep it clean and tidy. I've hardly ever seen any trash as you would call it dropped on the streets this is a it's a it's a brilliant place to come and as i've said already this is a great advert for your city this event it really is and the people here are fiercely proud of this event more than right. 200 000 expected to be on the streets around the start and finish line i mean this city stops this weekend for this for this event as the lead men now run up fairmont street they're approaching the Little Italy area. And why that's significant is that we talked about the changes to this course for this year. And usually, in years past, it would be just north of Booth, between Little Italy and Chinatown, that the course would take the runners into the province of Quebec. That has changed. They're going to continue along the Ottawa River. And there's just so much construction happening. There are a number of different major projects in the city 
And so that's part of the reason why this course is altogether different in 2023 than it was in 2022. Dylan has clarified that the course record, or we would have to call it an event record this year, because as you've indicated, Arash, the course is slightly different. The bonus still applies and still stands. So a reminder, it's Galetta Berka, the former world indoor 1500 meter champion, with that 2.22.17, also a silver medal on the track in the boiling heat of Beijing over 10,000 meters. 2.22.17 for the women, and then Schifferor's time of 2.06.04 from just 12 months ago, a $10,000 bonus for an event record. Vincent and Getich and Peter and Jeru doing a good job so far. They were asked for 206, and they're reasonably close to that, maybe just a shade, a shade under. Two pacemakers on the left of picture with the elite men tucked in just behind them. And we will try and keep an eye on whether we see Gaddis Shumi closing the gap on that group, but Not yet. he has been dropped from that group. And also. Gelchu, we're getting information that last year's runner-up is not in that lead group. Don't read too much into that just yet, because he came through the second half of the race last year like a steam train to finish in second place. He ran what we call in marathon running a brilliant negative split. All that means, it sounds very technical, it's not. Forgive me if you already know, but it's worth welcoming people in who are tuning into marathons for the first time. Negative splits simply means that you run the second half of the race quicker than the first. Yeah, Gelch is an interesting one. 25-year-old Ethiopian crossed the line in Ottawa last year at 209.23. Again, that was the runner-up performance. He, he called that one of the best of his career. He also ran a personal best 207.15 in Seville in February of last year, which was good for eight. And there's the Canadian, Melindy Elmore, of British Columbia, 43 years old. What a story she is. Six times an All-American at Stanford. She was a middle distance runner in, her, in the early stages of her career, competed for Canada at the Athens Olympics in 2004, gave up running. She thought her career was over in 2012. She was tired of the politics that were going on in the sport and some of the standards. She decided she was gonna start uh, a family. And, and this is what's interesting. And I'm just going to get on my pulpit here for a moment. For all the meathead coaches out there who say you have to specialize in a sport, here you have a two-time Olympian on her way to her third. Elmore was a soccer player, a skier, a field hockey athlete. But it was at age 12 she told herself, I want to be an Olympian one day in running. But she is emblematic that you can do so many different things and still perform at one at a high level. That's right, and I think it's really important for kids to be multi-sport, to have a variety of activities that they do and to not specialize too early. And Melindy having her two young kids herself, and she's a coach, she definitely sees the benefit to that. And, you know, back to the inspiration, when she watched uh, Joni Benoit win the first Olympic marathon in L.A. in 1984, that was a big inspiration for her, as well as uh, Leah Pals when she was fourth in the 1500 in Atlanta in the 96 Olympics. And at the press conference, uh, there were a lot of children there who were invited to ask questions, which is a really nice touch at the, at the expo, just a couple of kilometers away from where we are now. And she said she came out with something really interesting. The children asked her, talking about Melindy on the right, the pacemakers just beginning to pull away from the, the elite men on the left. Let's just quickly finish this Melindy story. The children asked her, when was the moment she knew she loved running? And she, she went straight into this story immediately and said, I went to fetch something for the family from a shop nearby and I had to jog uphill. And she said, I came back with whatever it was, uh, groceries or something under her arm. 
and I ran back down the hill and it was 400 meters. I got back into the house, she said I was 11. I got back into the house and I said to, da I said to my dad, Daddy, when you run, do you ever feel like you're literally flying? And her father turned back to her and said, no, I don't. But he said, I think there might be something really special for you with running, if that's how it makes you feel. And she said to the children on Friday, that was the exact moment she knew she was going to have a relationship with running. Wow. And that's, uh, you know, great that she that had that opportunity to speak to young kids because you never know what someone says in one moment in your life may inspire you and make a difference forever. So, you know, there may, may be one kid in that group who had that same feeling of, of, of flying and, and feeling so fast and inspired by her um, speaking to that young group. She's also an inspiration for a lot of people of middle age. I mean, after she had her first child, Charlie, who turns nine this summer, by the way, it was then that Elmore said, OK, I'm going to get myself into some triathlons. And then that became Ironmans. And then she made a podium in her first Ironman ever at a time of 8.57. And so she continued to do it recreationally. June of 2018, the second child, Oliver, arrived. And, and I asked her, how did you have your second kid and decide to get into marathon? And usually after kid number two, people get into wine. And she said that a number of her girlfriends were going to run the Chicago Marathon. And she said to herself, well, why don't I go pace them for 3.30? Just something to do, not miss out on the fun. And uh, the family said, you're ridiculous. I mean, this is September. You can't go run a marathon right now. So uh, they had four months to be ready for Houston. She ended up getting fitter and fitter by January of the next year. Uh, she ran in Houston. And uh, her point was, I just couldn't run slow. <laughs> Pretty good problem to have. Uh, she got to 232 when Oliver was six months old. Off to the races from there. Uh, Paris is 14 months away. I asked her, is that still in the plans? She said, well, of course. Why quit now? Um, she, she said, if you asked me three years ago, I would have laughed at the idea of the Olympics. Now she might be going to two. Right. And I think it was kind of just a, a casual conversation she was having with her husband about what would be next. You know, she, she did the Ironman event, which the training for that is so you know, time-consuming, the bike, the swim, the run. And I think doing that, that marathon in Houston, there was no pressure for her. So right. um, the, her baby at the time, Oliver, who's here today with his dad, was was six or seven months old. And there is a picture of her after the race sitting on the ground breastfeeding him, yeah. not in a chair, not feeding or, you know, herself, but, but, but looking after him, which is, you know, of course, um, what moms do and... Um, I think that's when she probably realized running a 232 with a seven-month-old baby, there was much more she could do. And, and she, she takes it back to the enjoyment, you know, to not put the pressure on her because so much of making national teams is all about numbers and times and standards. And she had to run for the sport because she, she loved it and, and always keep that focus and never lose that. Uh, of course, the, the time matters today because uh, that's what is required to be named to the team. So um, it, it's that combination of, of loving what she's doing in the training and and you know hitting that time it's going to be necessary to you know accomplish her next goal yeah so we need we need to keep a close eye on the clock don't we it's 226 50 in order to have a time valid and eligible for paris for next summer she ran 225 14 last year in toronto personal best is a 224 right she had the canadian marathon record uh before Natasha Bodak got it in Berlin. But right. um, Natasha running her 223 just this past fall is before the qualifying period. So she has not yet made the, the standard for the Olympics. But I believe she's going to be trying to do that this summer at the World Championships. And uh, the two of them trained together. Uh, Trent Stellenworth was a, a big part of, of helping them uh, be prepared for the heat uh, that we talked about before so you know if these two make the team again i think we could expect to see that they would be doing some some key runs together and uh they've been running against each other for years so it's it's neat to see you know 20 years later women still out running against each other 
Kevin Coffey is her uh, her lead pacer there. Uh, we just lost him on the screen, but he had that orange shirt, and we can we can go back to that story uh, uh, later. Oh, there he, oh, so there he is. So Kevin, what a great guy. Um, he's here with his wife and baby, and and he and Patty Birch have been kind of the the pacing team for Melindy recently. Uh, Patty being from Toronto, um, Kevin is with uh, Mile to Marathon coaching uh, with Dylan Wikes, who who started that group with Rob Watson, and. Um, Kevin had a very significant um, injury uh, to his brain, um, a, a terrible accident. And so he really found that running helped him not just physically, but mentally and emotionally to overcome that injury. And he is like the nicest guy. He's got the best mullet <laughs> that you can see. You know, the mullet have made a comeback. And, you know, it will be easy to spot him today with his orange shirt. Very encouraging, very positive. So when it's going to get difficult, we can expect to see him and, and Patty um, you know, encouraging Melindy to to dig deep uh, when it's going to get tough later on. You're watching coverage of the 2023 Tartan Ottawa International Marathon as part of Tamarack Race Weekend. Rash Madani, Krista Duchesne, Rob Walker with you on the call. Yesterday was the 10K, and let's give a little mention of Natasha Wodak from Surrey, BC, an Olympian in Rio in 2016. She ran the 10 thousand meters there and as you mentioned Krista set the new Canadian marathon record last September in Berlin uh, with with where things are now what did you like from what you saw of Wodak winning that race yesterday I think everyone was pleased to see that she was healthy she had um, she had a rough go after Berlin I mean 223 that's going to take its toll on your body and it's hard to know when you're ready to come back and and she's you know an experienced wise woman who isn't going to jump back in right away but it yeah. did take longer than what she expected so she was to run the London Marathon um, just last month in April and she had a bit of an injury in her ankle so she was looking after that and then that seemed to be okay with the cross training she doesn't do a lot of mileage but she was fit and then uh, unfortunately she got um, like a, a gastro um, virus that really wiped her out so she just knew that once she was like on the couch for several days and, and not doing well at all very weak that that she had to decide not to run which you know when you train for so long for an event and you only do a couple decent marathons a year it's it's really difficult to make that decision but I think when she was sick after the injury she just knew that 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 was the way it was going to be. Wodak's 41 now, and I thought something that was interesting, she talked about the last couple of years, she's been doing a lot more Pilates, it helps with her core and her pelvic floor, but she's also introduced a lot of cross training, an elliptical three or four times a week, and she says that's so much easier on the body. I mean, these days everybody's looking for all the different training methods, what works, what doesn't work for me, and what, you know, in air quotes was standard operating procedure in the past is not necessarily what it may be today. Right, and uh, Natasha Wodak, who um, runs occasionally with Leslie Sexton out in BC, you know, they're very different in their approach. Leslie tends to run higher mileage. Um, Natasha, you know, I mentioned this last night in the broadcast for the 10K, she did not want to run a marathon. She she did, she did it once just to kind of check the box, and she didn't particularly like it, but I think she knew that that was the best decision for her um, to transition from her success on the track with the 10,000 meter to move up to the half marathon and the marathon and she did have that marathon half marathon record for a short period of time first Canadian woman to go under 70 minutes and um, you know wouldn't it be great to see her and Melindy running again at the, the next Olympics in 2024. Paris awaits hard to believe that's next summer here's our lead group and as expected, it's a number of Africans, and there he is, Felix Kibitok. Rob, you called it. Well, he, he hasn't won it yet, but no, I'm just front and center, though. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm just really interested to see how how he will go. It, it, it's unusual. You you don't often see a lone Kenyan arriving at an event. Normally, there would be two or three or four, and and I just sure. love the fact that he's run that 59.08 half marathon and, and you just get the feeling that he's ready to improve that PB of 206.28 from Barcelona so Kipitok's there with 
a trio of great Ethiopians, and Shumi most certainly has been dropped. The man who came here as the fastest in the field on paper. Kibitok, by the way, hasn't raced since August last year. He went to Brazil and was third in the Buenos Aires half marathon. He looks, there's a long way to go. I'm not saying he's going to win the race, but he just looks really, really comfortable at this pace. And he obviously comes here on fresh legs, having not raced since last August. And as I said, he wouldn't have made this long journey unless he felt there was something special or something significant he could do to um, to further his marathon career because with 59.08 he should be on paper capable of running much quicker than 206. At this point and miles to go before we sleep the prediction is a 205.54 finish. That's how it's looking. Split of 256. The men through 13K officially went 38.47. I mean, Kibbe took's one of those. You know, we talked about parenthood for some of these for some of these runners. He's now married. He's got a two-year-old. Jerry L. Kibbet is the is the child. So life's changed a little bit for Kibbe took, which is in part why he has raced a little less over the last couple of years. But no finer motivation when you become a parent. What, what, a, what a great motivation to try and do your best and create a great legacy for your for your children and for your wider family. And it sounds like he's been quite um, empathetic to, to, to his wider family members and taking the responsibility of looking after them as seriously as possible. Now that looks it's a little tidier at that uh, elite drink station. So the bottles are placed uh, strategically so that um, the athletes that you expect to be in a group together will not be grabbing their bottles from the same table. You don't want any sort of uh, interference or collisions. Uh, you want to be able to space out, grab your bottle, hold it, carry it, and drink w without any problems. But you will definitely see people looking over their shoulder. To avoid that, we've got some bottle sharing uh, so that the pacers can be hydrated and, and fueled to do their job. And, and again, very key. You do not want to miss your bottle um, as, as you're uh, in, in this part of the race or any part of the race. Uh, interesting as well. Um, I noticed Kibitok was sharing his bottle with and Jerry with Vincent and Getich. As he is the only Kenyan in the race, um, he'll be able to communicate with them in Swahili. If he feels like maybe he, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting for a moment there'd be any game playing against the Ethiopians also in that league group, not at all. But it's a handy coincidence that should he wish to exchange a word or two uh, with his fellow Kenyans, he can do so in his mother tongue. Most of the Kenyans who travel speak English, but their first tongue uh, is, uh, is Swahili. So Kibitok was just sharing a drink there with his two compatriots who are doing a fine job on the pacemaking duties at the moment, but three very, very good Ethiopians behind him. And this is now the part of the race where the runners are moving into Quebec. They are running on the Champlain Bridge. This is part of a stretch where the course is a little quicker, a little more downhill. Overall, the course is a bit slower than before, um, but this is, you know, a good two and a half, three kilometers. Once they get to Boulevard Lucerne, it's one of the fastest parts of the course, and this is where some damage can be done. And also, I, I just think it's worth reminding ourselves with, with this Ottawa Marathon, the second half of this course lends itself to negative splits, right. lends itself to athletes potentially coming through and making that predicted cumulative time even quicker. You know, this is this is a it makes the race that much more interesting that you know we've seen it before, most notably last year. We know these guys can get quicker in the second half of the race. So around about 206 or just under 206, normally you'd start thinking, well, OK, if the course record is 206 and they're on 206 at halfway, they're bound to start slowing down. That's not necessarily the case with Ottawa. 
And it's difficult to run a negative split. Um, you know, ideally, you run an even split so that you're giving a, a consistent effort, um, you know, for every kilometer of the race. Of course, it depends on, you know, the downhill and whatnot that you would get at, at different points in the race to determine what your pace will be. But um, it, it's when it gets so challenging in the end, the heat creeps up. If you've got hills in the end, you know, having that negative split is, you know, next to impossible. But it, it certainly does uh, make it fun to follow and to see athletes who are so consistent. Des Linden, who won the 2018 Boston Marathon. She's quite well known for that. You look at her her two half marathons and a marathon, and you know, it's pretty much down to the to the second how consistent she is with her pacing. Yeah, some great, uh, some great American women have produced wonderful performances. Didn't, um, am I right in saying, correct me if I'm wrong here, I'm going way back in my memory banks. Did Dina Castor run negative splits en route? Did she get the bronze in Athens? She might have done, I'll check that. By the way, the elite men went through, uh, this is just a split with my own eye. Uh, they went through 15K in just a few seconds inside, uh, judging this by the marker at the side of the course, just a few seconds inside 45 minutes. So 2.06 maybe, 2.06.10, I'll check that. I think Dina Castor might have picked up the bronze in Athens, and if she did, she ran negative split. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure about the negative split, but she did get the bronze. Uh, of course, we want to mention our, our Canadian men that are here today. Uh, we don't have anyone that's going after uh, the Olympic standard like Melindy, but um, there is a group of them that are on pace for about 218, and there's about five Americans in that group. So both um, the men's and the women's race have uh, Americans who are trying to get times to qualify for their Olympic trials, just like we know there's uh, a group of 11, 11 Japanese men that are here to get the what's required to make their Olympic trials as well. One of the Canadian men, the Vesalius, now lives not far from Ottawa, about 45, 50 minutes away in Winchester, where he is a big animal vet. He works on horses and calves. And Vesalius is from Riverglade, New Brunswick, did his undergrad at St. Avex, went on to University of Prince Edward Island competed in the Atlantic University Conference, dealt with some injuries during his college career, and is finally now finding his stride at this stage of things. And uh, he's done some pacing for women. He was uh, pacing last year with the top uh, Canadian women in the race in the marathon last year. And um, he has a personal best of, of 2, uh, 18, 41. And, um, Interesting, he did a summer internship in Kenya in 2018, so probably enjoyed the, the running that would come with that um, when he was working to become a large animal vet. Do you know, it, it's interesting you talking about Vesalius and, and his career because, you know, vet, to become a vet requires such incredible dedication as sure. well as mental agility. And Great Britain's Laura Muir who got an Olympic silver medal, finally got a global medal uh, in the 1500 meters uh, and a great, a great performance last year in Eugene where I think she got the bronze as well. Laura Muir has balanced her life as an elite athlete by also training to become a vet. So I wonder if there's something in that elite sports person's mindset where they are, they're, they're able to go into a super focused mode. And in the case of Vesalius and Laura Muir, maybe it's a welcome distraction rather than a hindrance that they can force themselves to go down a slightly more academic route as a, as a, a, a kind of foil and, and a sort of a, a, a diluting of the pressure from their competitive days. I mean, uh, it's making me feel inadequate. <laughs> Qualified vet and international athletes. I mean, what's wrong with us? Right. Right. I, I definitely Where agree with that. Where do we zig that. instead of zag, Rob? You, you need to have that balance where, you know, you've got your time committed to your training during the day and you've got to give everything you've got because there's not an op another opportunity. You can't wait for good weather to go out and run in the afternoon instead of the morning. And, you know, with um, runners in the race who have, who have young children, it's the same kind of thing. You've got that window that you can do that training in. It also allows you emotionally to invest in something rather than just, you know, 
only focusing on the training, so I think it allows that, that life balance and having goals and focus in various aspects of, of your life because sometimes, sometimes things don't go the way you want and it's good to have that other career focus that can occupy your, your mind if you have injury or if you have to, um, you know, withdraw from a race for whatever reason. But back to the, the vet thing, you know, they're, they'd be on their feet all day. It's one thing when you're working full time and you're sitting at a desk, you can save your legs and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, uh, what an appreciation of the effort that they put into their training um, when they are, are working long days on their feet. Yeah, he mainly works with cows, horses, and sheep, he told me. And he said it can definitely be harder on the body dealing with bigger animals. Right. No kidding. For me. sure. <laughs> of course, uh, very understated as we take a look at another Canadian. There is Melindy Elmore again. She is the top Canadian at this point. And she is expected to finish as the top Canadian. And, you know, for Elmore, there's a lot of gratitude at this stage of her career. She said, look, I, I never expected to be doing this. And she said, I'm so grateful. And, you know, getting to meet so many different people, running marathons, being able to do this as an inspiration for my kids who get to watch me do it. And she said, my goals may be different at this stage of my life, but I still want to push myself to be the best that I can be. And I think, you know, Melinda has perspective. She knows that it might not work out. She not make, might not make the team. Of course, we hope that she does. But, you know, she can certainly be proud of what she's accomplished. And it's like, you know, kind of setting the bar higher every time and, and reaching that goal, which is, which is exciting. But having gratitude and appreciation that, um, you know, maybe she was at the top of her game. But, um, you know, it's that, that the unknown. But, again, pushing herself to that goal um, to achieve that. We'll try and keep you posted as to the time that Melindy uh, is posting at 15K. Remember, she's trying to run inside 226.50, which would be a Paris valid qualification. Qualification for Budapest is 228 on the nose, but it's, it's stricter than that for Paris for the Olympic Games. Meanwhile, uh, just another quick update. We've got Lulisa, Makasha and Kajeta. The three athletes born and raised in Ethiopia, although Kajeta, of course, represented the Germans in fine style, where she's now made her life and had a, had a baby. Sixth in the Olympics, but her first marathon coming back. So the three we would have expected to be in that front group of elite women are still there. And as far as the elite men are concerned, the fastest man in the field on paper has been dropped, Gadis Ashumi. We've got the likes of Felix Kivitok, Braha and Adane, who won Barcelona last year, just inside 206. So we've got three great stories unfolding here from a Canadian perspective. Melindy trying to get the Olympic qualification time, and then we've got two great elite races. And this is an interesting part for you, because this is Boulevard Lucerne, which is not only flat, but it's one of the fastest parts of the course for the elite men. They, they have a good two and a half, three kilometers here before they reach the incline, which becomes the steepest incline in the entire race. So here's a real moment for these runners to pick up some ground. And to maybe just turn the screw a little bit and get back yeah. down to sub 206. Just watching. The pacemakers have done a really good job here. Getichen and Jeru. Here comes that incline. This is the incline at La Nodiere, and I spoke with somebody who ran this course, and they said it's not long, this incline, but when facing it, it is daunting. If you, if you run a marathon, any incline at all can uh, can affect your legs. That's one of the reasons why New York is not necessarily the quickest of courses, because it involves, I mean, it's an amazing place to go and run, but it involves going over quite a few bridges. And if you've run across those bridges in New York, you will certainly be aware that there are a couple of inclines. And they're just having a chat with each other there. They've just allowed a few seconds or a few meters to grow between themselves and that lead group. 
So they were just saying to each other, well, OK, let's, let's hold back a fraction. Four in that chase group with Kibitok and the three Ethiopians. Now, if you missed it earlier, the Pacers will not finish the race. And that, that's an important point here. They can pull the shoot at the 30 kilometer mark if they'd like. They can go as far as 35 kilometers. And there is Lee Wasalius, the New Brunswicker, who is the lead Canadian man at this point. He said, if all the stars align, if everything goes my way, yeah, that, that, that would be the goal for this race for me. And he said, you know, a lot of this is going to depend on the weather. He doesn't enjoy the heat. The hotter days affected him, the hotter day rather affected him in Vienna earlier this spring where he left that race. He said, you know, six to seven degrees would be ideal. He really likes it cool, but at this stage of things, just past the 17K mark, there is Lewis Alias on your far left, the lead Canadian. Good performance for a PB over the half marathon in Vancouver earlier this year, 64. 17. Perhaps looks a little bit uncomfortable there. Just keep an eye on him. He just got himself away from that group. Maybe just wanted some clear space around him. He's now at the back of that group. I, I don't know. Now he's moving over to the right-hand side or his left. Could be something of nothing. Ah, he just wanted to go under the uh, the mist. So you mentioned about the fact that he doesn't necessarily the like the, oh. the heat. Yeah. He moved right over to the left-hand side of the course there to ensure that he got cooled by the water. Take what you can get when you get it. But um, one thing I often do is just focus on when I'm going to get my next drink and gel. And, and um, you know, with every five kilometers, the aid stations tables are on the right in this race. That can be something that you're thinking about is, you know, grabbing that next uh, gel or water bottle um, to, to occupy your mind because uh, 42 kilometers is a long time. So Lee Wasselius on the left. And Melinda Elmore. The veteran still going strong at the age of 43 on the right of picture. And on the left there is Alex Maxwell, the 28-year-old Canadian. Yeah, 65-minute man for the half marathon. He'd love to put the challenge towards the Roselius. Battle for pride going on a little way behind the elite male leaders who aren't that far away from the halfway stage actually you mentioned about Kevin uh, doing the pacing duties with Melindy I, I might be showing my age here I'm 48 I still can't believe that mullets have made a comeback <laughs> on both sides of the Atlantic it's ludicrous isn't it Yes, it, it is definitely it's something that we didn't expect to stay. I think during the pandemic, a lot of people weren't bothering to get their hair cut. And now, um, you know, some people are still not getting their hair cut since then, but we're also seeing some hairstyles that have come back that we didn't expect to, to see again. It used to be kind of a hockey thing, but I think it's something that we're seeing uh, further than that. You won't be seeing that in my house. I'm a short back and sides man. 
Keep it simple, keep it straight. But maybe your little guy, because it's, well, it's her thing with young kids oh, too. Oh yeah, like... I, I, I don't know how I'd feel if my son suddenly said he's gonna grow a mullet. But anyway, he's still under my control at the age of nine, but that won't remain the case forever. <laughs> <laughs> Melinda Elmore's eldest son is turning nine this summer, and she remains the lead Canadian woman. Really is amazing though, isn't it? Competed at the 2004 Athens Olympics in the 1500 meters after winning a nationals that year. And 17 years after her Olympic debut, top 10 finish at the Olympics in the marathon. She has a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations and a Bachelor of Arts in Education, as well as her Master's in Environmental Design from the University of Calgary. I, I believe, she, I thought she did some, some teaching at some point. Um, maybe I'm getting her mixed up with Hilary Sellingworth, who I think, who taught as well. Um, but, you know, definitely um, very successful, and now she's coaching and an inspiration for, for people um, who are after their next goals and dreams. This is the leading group of elite women going up that little incline that Arash was indicating a few moments ago when the men went. Now, one of the trio has been dropped, and I think it might be Melissa. I think Melissa might have been dropped. We will, we will keep a close eye on that. There were three in that group together. Yeah, it's now, there are the only red. two. Yeah, Mikasha is definitely in the red. And Kajeta is in there with um, the multicolored kit. So it's Melissa. Melissa, who's got the quickest time in the field on paper, second in Seville earlier this year. So how interesting. In the elite men's race, the fastest man in the field on paper ran 204.59 in Seville, and he's been dropped. Aberu Ayana Melissa ran 221.54 in Seville earlier this year, and she's been dropped. So the two quickest who both ran their times at great marathons in Spain. As we watch Melinda Elmo here. Uh, Melissa has been dropped, so it's Makesha and Kajeta. We now have a leading duo in the elite women's race. Cam Levins and the rest of the guys doing a good job on the pacemaking duties, but three have become two. And when was the Seville Marathon? When was? Seville. Uh, uh, 19th of February. Okay, so right, that is a little bit ambitious to, to turn around and to run a, a marathon just a few oh, months later. And of course, that's the race that didn't work out for Melindy. So maybe this is this is the better day. Cam Levin's on the left, just yep. checking his watch. Said he would do two hours, so it should be feeling pretty comfortable. As Krista was saying, he's building up towards the half marathon, the National Half Marathon Championships. And you know, uh, just talking about Cam just for a moment, we talked a lot about the 205 that he produced in Tokyo for the North American record. But I thought his run to finish just off the podium in Eugene with what was then a national record of low 207s was a phenomenal performance. And it bodes well for his aspirations for a medal for Budapest in August this year. Right, and he's not shy to say that's his goal to have a, to be on the podium at either the World Championships and or the Olympics. He's he's doing his research. He was planning to run the, the World Championships this summer, but is changing focus so that he can perhaps run a marathon that's uh, more similar with what will be in Paris. The, the hills are going to be pretty brutal, and I think he just wants to prepare for that. We talk, talked about it last night on the broadcast after seeing um, Kip Chogi, who everyone knows um, not do so well in Boston, which is a hilly course. I think that was a bit of an eye-opener for Cam to say, you know, I want to focus on, on something that's going to be a bit more challenging. And uh, he's working more uh, diligently with the strength work. And, um, you know, he's back to the high mileage. So when he had that disappointment in uh, in Japan when running the, the marathon at Sapporo, he, he went back to kind of refocus and rebuild with his coach Jim Finlayson to, to make a plan that would work for him, uh, the things that did work to continue and the things that maybe weren't uh, working to, to change or discontinue. Good return trip for him to Japan at the Tokyo Marathon earlier this year. Finished fifth, running 205.36. Okay. 
Yeah, that was a pretty special day. I had run the, the race myself, and there was a bus that was taking elite athletes back to the hotel, and I didn't make that bus, but I was going to go for the second one, and no one was around, and sure enough, Cam walks on the on the bus with his wife, Liz, and um, it was just the two of us, so really special for me to share that moment with him when I was, you know, at the end of my career, and uh, such a humble, gracious person who just, um, you know, loves the sport. He's had a lot of, you know, high highs and low lows with his career, that devastating foot injury in 2016 that required surgery, wasn't able to make the Olympic team then, and then um, it took him a couple tries to make the standard to be named to the team for um, for Tokyo, and, uh, you know, one race that he didn't finish and just made it kind of last minute when he went over to, to run in Austria, and the weather wasn't great, but got the standard. Um, uh, it's it's just really great to see um, him bounce back when people kind of tossed it away thinking, you know, maybe he's done all that he can do. He just seems to come back and believe in himself to to get that performance he knows he's capable of. And he, he believes he's capable of faster and better. And we as Canadians are really excited to follow that. It's, it's a really good story with Cam, the, fa the fact that he has had his dark days. It hasn't all been handed to him on a plate. Now, just having a little look on the left of picture, this is the furthest away the two pacemakers have been from their lead group for the entire race. They've probably opened up now. We're looking at the leading elite women with Cam Levin's doing a good job here. So three have become two because Melissa has been dropped. So we've got Makesha in the red, who's run inside 223, and Malak Kajeta only running her third marathon. We haven't seen her in a marathon since she had a baby after crossing the line pregnant, but she didn't know it at the time in Tokyo when she was six, just inside 2.30. But just a quick mention of the elite men's race, the two pacemakers have allowed a significant gap to open between them and that little group of three or four just behind them. So we'll keep a close eye whether they relax the pace a little bit and allow that group to reattach. So you mentioned Kajeta and finishing sixth at the Olympics and not knowing she was pregnant when doing so. What a story she is. Now 30 years old, the mother of one. And she said, I would have liked to have stayed in Ethiopia and run for my country. She went to the Olympics under the German flag. You know, the Olympics have mattered to her so much. It's the reason why she's here. As a kid growing up, they had no money. And after school, she would work in a market. And one day while working there, the Olympic marathon was on TV. And then some track and field was on TV. And Kajeta was watching famous Ethiopian runner Tarunish Diababa compete and win a gold medal. And, you know, Kajeta was in the market watching that. And she said, I want to do that. I want to run like her. And at the last Tokyo Olympics, she did exactly that. But you talk about adversity. Here's somebody who had to escape Ethiopia by herself at a very young age in the middle of the night. She arrived in Belgium. She didn't know the language. She didn't know anybody. She was able to meet a fellow African who got her to a refugee camp. She spent some time there. And only after numerous applications to get into Germany, did they accept her in? And then she started to run. And now here she is, an Olympian for Germany. She's a member of the police force in her day job. And she is a mom. She trains, she runs 160 kilometers a week in her training. And she said, I am motivated more now in motherhood than at any other time in my career. And maybe we will see her on the podium in uh, 2024 in Paris. The story that would be. Yeah, and, and, and history has shown that some athletes do come back stronger in marathon terms, having had a family. I believe after Liz McColgan had Elish, who, who replicated her mum's 10,000 meter victory at the Commonwealth Games with a great race in Birmingham last summer. That's one of the most exciting races I've ever commentated on. Uh, the Scottish athlete Elish, and then uh, had a had a hug and an embrace with her mum who was in the stadium. 
I think Liz got better after after childbirth, and the same could potentially be said of Kajeta. Interesting, you mentioned about her being inspired by Tiranish de Barba, one of the great, one of the great, and I mean that across male and female, uh, 10,000 meter runners of all time de Barba, two golds and a bronze, absolutely incredible. Um, the children at the press conference on Friday also spoke to Kajeta, and they asked her, what does she think about when she's in pain, when she has to find some extra level. And it made me realize she's a true historian of our sport because she said she thinks about Abiba Bakila. Now, if you're not familiar with marathon running, Abiba Bakila has a gigantic significance in distance racing history for the following reason. He became the first black African to win an Olympic gold medal when he won the marathon in 1960 in Rome and then successfully defended his title in Tokyo. And one of the reasons that Rome was so iconic, it wasn't just that he opened the gateway for generations of great African athletes. His shoes were hurting him because he'd always grown up running in bare feet and he famously kicked off his shoes before he got to the finish line uh. and won that title in bare feet. And she mentioned that, she said, I think about, when it gets tough, oh, I think about Abiba Bikila oh, and all that's followed since him. And I think about the moment when he was in so much pain wearing the shoes that he kicked them off. So she's... She's a deep thinker, that lady. She, she's, she's a great historian of her sport. And I thought that was quite interesting that she thinks about a specific moment in history when the going gets tough. One of her quotes, failing and losing makes me stronger. She says it pushes me to work harder. story for you know what gets them out of bed and, and the motivation required to do the training for the marathon so it's really neat to he hear these different stories because it's different for everyone it's a question that elites are often asked you know what do you think about well my brain works so different than everyone else's and and yours will too so i think you have to kind of hear that story or let that little idea in your mind grow and that's good is will inspire you because that story might not inspire someone else to to dig deep when it gets difficult it gets painful but uh, that's a really interesting uh, way for her to be to be motivated Whilst we're talking about the leading elite women, that's Makesha, who's just up behind Cam Levins, and there's a little tiny gap growing to Malak Kajeta, the athlete we've just been talking about, who ran so well uh, in Tokyo a couple of years ago. That's Waganesh Makesha, who was fifth in Chicago last year with a low 223. She is stalking Cam Levins. She's also a mom. She's got two kids under the age of five. So uh, a neat story with Kajeta and, of course, Melinda Elmore with her two young boys. As a personal best of 222.45. That was back in 2019 in Dubai. So I wonder whether Kajeta is just beginning to feel it. We'd have to wait to see whether that angle pulls out. She, she was only a few meters behind. She was roughly still attached to that group but cameras focusing on the Kesha who's certainly not allowing any distance at all to grow between herself and, and Cam Levins. The pacemakers on the left look like they have oh there is Kajeta right so we might get it if the camera just pulls back our camera crew's doing a fantastic job. If we just, we might get a glimpse here as to whether she has allowed a few meters or not to grow. Maybe just beginning to rock and roll a tiny bit. Oh, there it yeah, is. she has. Yeah, she has. She's she's become detached from Makesha. So the first little bad patch from which Malak Kajeta needs to bounce back on the right of picture because Makesha is right on the shadow of Cam Levins. And uh, Kajeta has her own personal pacer, so, you know, that can definitely be uh, an advantage because if she's having a little bit of rough, a rough spot, which, you know, happens all the time, she may pull ahead, um, her personal pacer will be sticking with her.
So we're down to two in the elite women's race with Kajeta just allowing a few metres or so to grow, but we've still got this group of what? Yeah, four. The, the, and they're on their way back into Ottawa. They are on the Alexandra Bridge at a nearing the 25 kilometre mark as they head back into Ontario. So th this is where things get a little bit interesting because this is the place to attack when you talk to the to the race organizers. Here's an opportunity to really, you know, there's an incline to get onto the bridge and then it flattens out. Um, this is uh, this is a chance to go and, and make a move. You walk across this bridge to get in from your hotel. We were trying to work out before we came on air. Arash is in a different hotel to us. Yeah, not this one, no. Right. I, I, I stayed on the other side of that bridge last year. The architecture and the expertise that went into building that bridge was absolutely incredible. It's over a hundred years old. Every morning last year, when I walked over that bridge uh, to come to the the race concourse, I couldn't believe the intricacies and the skill of the architecture of the men and women who uh, who, who put that bridge together uh, over a hundred years ago. I know it's got nothing to do with the race, but I saw it every single day and I took photos of it and sent them to friends of mine who work in engineering and they said that is an incredible feat of, of human skill and manufacturing. So yeah, you, yet another great our iconic landmark in uh, in Ottawa. I think we do have a split from Melindy Elmore, uh, one thirteen thirty at the half point. So that would get her about two twenty seven. So hopefully she can find about ten or eleven seconds to get that standard. Yeah, that, that's pretty much bang on, almost to the nearest second, as long as she can keep it going. Men through 25, so 114.54. Yep, just around about 114.50. Well, 115 on the nose would be 206.30, so they've been fairly consistent. And just looking back to the weather, we started at about, what, 14 degrees, 72% uh, humidity, and right now we're at 17 degrees Celsius, and uh, the humidity has dropped to about 55%, so looking good. Usually, it, uh, you know, the heat creeps up, but um, it's, it's not as, as high as we thought it would be, so hopefully um, yeah, the athletes continue. we expecting low 20s at this point. Right. Yeah, I mean, this race, we've had low or high 20s at the sure. finish, and even last night in the 10K, we saw athletes who were, you know, dropping at the finish line because the, the conditions were really rough. And that group of three or four in the elite men's race has now splintered. There are only two Ethiopians who are still relatively close to the trio of Kenyans. Remember, two of them, Ngetic and Njera, are pacemakers. It's Felix Kibitok who has tracked the pacemakers, and there are two Ethiopians behind him where previously there were three and four. This is beginning to splinter. The lead group just passing the National Art Gallery coming on to Sussex Drive. You know, the marathon certainly is is a, a longer event to watch, and I think what amazes some people, including myself, who I've, I've, I've done the event, you know, many times, uh, is you can still have next to, like, a photo finish at the end. You can have athletes who, who stick together from beginning to end. They might have a, a few times where they're, they're off a bit, but, you know, you get some pretty wicked finishes with some sprints at, on, that, on that straightaway toward the finish line. Oh, you, yeah, you can go right down, right down to the wire. Uh, by the way, that, that's, a, that's a, becoming a significant gap. We were wondering about Milan Kajeta going through a little bit of a bad patch. She was the other woman following Cam Levins, but now Makesha is on her own following Cam. And Kajeta, well, that was the time at halfway, but of course, Kajeta is now a long way back rather than a second behind. And look how quickly Kesha. it's changed in the last eight and a half minutes. They were neck and neck 
And over the last stretch of time, this is where the gap is really, really widened. Yeah, that is that is a, that is a significant gap, and it has happened quickly. Yeah. And uh, I think Cam is planning to do about two hours, so we're looking at another 40 minutes that we could see the two of them together, which would be really helpful for Makasha. And they've just gone through 15k in about or 25k in about 119 and a half. So what you're watching now on the left, Cam Levins, the pace setter, the Canadian Olympian, and the lead woman runner of this 2023 Tartan Ottawa International Marathon is Waganesh Makesha, a 31-year-old from Ethiopia, had a top five finish in Chicago last year, placed 10th in Dubai in February, and she ran that one at 227.25, so when the pace was set for 222 today, you felt that may have been a big ask, but she is on her way. Has a personal best time at 222.45. Right, uh, it looks like she's on pace to be about 221.35, and the men at about 206.26 at this point in the race. And, you know, we've got the, the story of the Japanese men that are here to try to get their time to run for their Olympic trials. We're hopefully going to get an update on them so that we can keep uh, viewers informed. Ah, uh, yes. It, it, that was her going through 24K, not 25. So, yeah, because if she'd been going through 25, as I mentioned, it would have been about 213. Very, very good running. With around about an hour or so to go for her as Cam Levins checks his watch. Not the smoothest uh, running action we've ever seen, but it's clearly effective for Makesha. And I, I had a little look at her major championship record as well, because I always think it's interesting, Krista, to see, you know, we've got such a trend these days of athletes going straight to marathons when they're 19, 20, 21, as opposed to the sort of traditional route where you would go through the gears, as it were, and be a great 5,000 meter runner, then 10,000 meter, and then, and then step up. But Makesha has got good pedigree on the track and cross country. I remember commentating, I can't remember her specifically, but I was in Punta Umbria in 2011, uh, commentating on the World Cross Country Championships, and she was only just off the podium then, in fourth as a junior, and she also got a bronze in the African Junior Championships over 3,000 meters. So there were signs early on with her career that she had great strength on the road and on the track, rather, and on cross country. So she hasn't just come out of nowhere. She's she's come through a, a really grueling process where she's been a good junior on the track and in cross country, and maybe, Maybe this could turn out to be a career-defining moment for her for the marathon if she can keep this going. And running fast on the track is one thing where, you know, nothing's changing. It's flat the whole time, but cross-country, that, that takes some grit and strength, definitely. So that's what is going to be to her advantage in, in the marathon today is, is that experience from, you know, the cross-country courses that can be pretty grueling. So as the lead women come into Ottawa, the lead men are passing the Governor General's residence, and it is effectively a three-horse race at this point on the lead men's side. Meanwhile, with the women, it is Waganesh Makesha who is running away with it as they cross the Alexandria Bridge. Uh, by, by the way, I don't know whether you can pick this up on our microphones, but the, um, we're, we're positioned at the, at the finish area in our studio. The PA music system 
has just started booming behind us, obviously in anticipation of the great scenes of drama and relief and emotion that we'll see at the finish line. So, yeah, you may hear a little bit of dance music seeping into our microphones. It's not us, uh, it's the PA system behind us as they gear up for, for what is going to be a, a, a very special couple of hours here in Ottawa at the finish line. You can see Cam is looking over his shoulder, just making sure that he's, uh, you know, looking after uh, the runner that he's assigned to pace. Um, sometimes you can point things out on the road, um, little bumps or things that might cause an athlete to trip up, just kind of point that out and, of course, encourage them, um, point toward the upcoming bottle station, that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, definitely taking his job seriously as we would expect Cam to do because, you know, he's certainly appreciated and benefited from from pacers in the races that he's done. So uh, really just gracious for him to return this favor uh, to the lead women today in this race. There is a significant difference between a good pace setter and not, <laughs> right? For sure, yeah. And it's it's trust, right? Um, you know, some people say they, they carry you and I mean, yeah, it definitely helps. You don't have to look at your watch, but you're, you're still doing the work, but you know, it's, it's often that encouragement when there's some of beside you you know some athletes they do their training primarily by themselves so maybe they wouldn't need that encouragement but just to have someone just kind of keep that rhythm you know just look at the back of their shirt and not think about anything else can be very helpful um, you know mentally when when you're when you're working hard by the way the, the, the split the 25k was 123 52. An event record is not out of the question. We can't call it a course record because the course has slightly changed this year, but the um, the course record is 2.22.17, Galetta Berka, but we might potentially, if she can keep this going, see a new event record. That is sub 2.22. That's very, very fast. So we did get an update from Brett Larner with uh, Japan Running News on Twitter. Um, I just reached out to him directly. So Tekichu Ono and Osaki are on track for qualifying. That's about the 25 kilometer mark. So that's uh, good to see that. And it looks like Kanamori and Otsu uh, are just off. So uh, thanks a lot to Brett for that, that update um, to know where the Japanese men are um, in their attempt to get the, the necessary qualification to make their Olympic trials. And the significant element of that, remember, if you're just joining us, we're talking about the Japanese athletes who need a combined average of under two of 2.10.0 or under to qualify for their Olympic trials. And actually, the three you've mentioned who are in contention, Ryo Osaki, I say only in brackets, uh, needs a 2.11.30. Takaguchi needs a 2.11.03 and Ono, who was second in the Asian Youth Championships a few years ago on the track, he needs a 2.09.45. So the three Japanese athletes who at the moment look like they will be qualifying for the trials are three athletes who already had a time that was close to the 2.08 qualification. So they didn't face the most onerous of tasks and it's looking good for those three at the moment. And for Rio Man Takeuchi, this has been a long time coming. He finished fourth in the Prague Marathon. He actually trains with Alexander Mutiso of Kenya. They're in the part of the same training regimen. And, you know, for Takeuchi, this is a little personal too. He's in a unique situation. The way it works in Japan is that you're affiliated with a team and a sponsor, and that team that he's a part of hasn't been strong enough to get into the national championships and be on national television. But if he was to have a great race here in Ottawa, that would get his team into the nationals. It would get him into the Olympic trials. A very highly motivated Takeuchi here at the 2023 Tartan Ottawa International Marathon. Just a quick clarification on those three. You've got Adane just on the very edge of picture on the right, the one Barcelona last year. The two men wearing similar vests. It's a Braha of Ethiopia on the right. 
former world junior silver medalist on the track over 10,000 metres. And then Felix Kibitop, this brilliant half marathon runner, trying to step up to the marathon on the left of picture, checking his watch with almost an hour and a half of running done. We now have a three-way battle for the Ottawa title. Fascinating race and fascinating last 35 minutes or so to go in the elite men's race. And, and two Ethiopians and a Kenyan. So uh, typical what you would see in, uh, in marathoning is the battle between those two countries. You see Abraha there in the middle of the three. This is the fourth time he's racing in Canada. Twice in Toronto, once in Moncton, New Brunswick. And now here in Ottawa, he's got a career high world ranking of number 46 in the marathon right now. And it's been a strong 12 month stretch for him. He first won LA, excuse me, LA, and then he went to the Slovenia marathon last October and won it there. And he finished fourth in the Dubai marathon three months ago where he clocked to 2.06.08 in February. So this has been a pattern now and a strong stretch for Abraha, who is nearing his 31st birthday this summer. And, and the interesting thing about those two marathons, the Slovenian one and then Dubai, there was only a second between the times that he posted. So he is running unbelievably consistency, consistently. 2.06.08 in Dubai, 2.06.09 in Slovenia, so this is this is in his ballpark. Low low to mid 206s is, is definitely an area where he would feel comfortable. This is going to be a brilliant last 35. And the men were pretty much 130 on the nose at 30k, which is 206 and a half. So Neo Andulem uh, Schifferall has the course record at 2.06.04. Maybe, just maybe, we might see an event record. It's certainly on the cards in the elite women's race because Waganesh Makesha is running really well at the moment and, it has to be said, benefiting from some excellent pacemaking by Cam Levins following up his second place finish in the 10K behind Mohamed last night. Now, I wonder if Makesha has just begun to slow ever so slightly because if we look at the right-hand picture here, Cam Levins, or he was, having to look over his shoulder quite a bit, and I wonder whether that indicates that she was just beginning to slow down ever so slightly. One pacemaker left in the elite men's race. Adane just allowing a few metres to grow. That's Abraha on the right of picture there. The Ethiopian we were talking about having run so consistently in recent years. And just out of picture to the left is Felix Kibitop, who hasn't raced since August last year. But that's a Braha. And there, the Kenyan running behind his compatriots, still doing a good job with regards to the pacemaking. They are on the Sir George Etienne Cartier Parkway, and this is where the race really starts. We are past the 30 kilometer mark of this 2023 Tartan Ottawa International Marathon. And this is where you can make up time, where Hemlock becomes Beechwood at about the 33 kilometer mark. It slightly goes downhill. And if the runners are feeling good at this stretch, you could have a sub three kilometer. Uh, it's, it's about to be, not yet, it's about to be nicely shaded. And there's next to no wind coming up in this stretch. So here's a real opportunity for these runners to go after that course record, or that event record, I should say. Well, that's interesting. I, I thought the I thought the other pacemaker had stopped, but he was off the front just by about two or three meters. So both of them are still there. Adane just about hanging on to that group. He was taking quite a few sips from his water, so it may just have been that that had cost him a, a couple of strides. No, both pacemakers are still there. You I, I don't know, you just get the impression that 
Kibitok's quite keen to push this off. Yeah. We have uh, Manny Rodriguez, who was the elite coordinator in the past before Dylan Wakes, who's sending us some notes, and he says that Kibitok looks the freshest. So uh, your assessment, uh, perhaps, is, is accurate with his. Yeah, it just, it's just the way he's looking around. He's, he's, he's looking comfortable. You can see the volunteers there, of course, who make this day so successful this weekend. Um, they had uh, the wet towels out there. Sometimes you've seen sponges in the past. Uh, the towels, sometimes you can take it and wrap it around your neck or just kind of wipe off uh, some sweat or some, some towels maybe, maybe that are, you know, sticking to your face. Um, but it, it looks like the men didn't grab it, so perhaps they're quite comfortable, you know, with these conditions, not as hot as we thought it would be. Uh, we're up to about 70 degrees now, so it, has, it hasn't gotten um, that much warmer since the last time I said what the temperature was, and again, it's only about three or four degrees higher than when the race started uh, earlier this morning. And both men pacers have dropped now at the 31-ish kilometer mark, and this is the place where the runners can really try to make moves around the 30 to 35 K mark in on this track. It can be as late as the 40 K mark too. We've seen over the years uh, Tariku Jafar. He lost in a sprint finish in Japan a few months before the 2013 Auto Marathon. He learned his lesson. He stayed back that year when he came to the capital and he made a move in that final stretch to win it. And you think back even further, Krista, uh, David Chariot. He relied on, on a kick for a sprint finish in each of his three titles, 2007, 2008, and 2009. And you know, when the pacers drop off, that's kind of where the, the gloves come off, where people start to kind of um, be a bit more strategic in terms of the moves they want to make. Sometimes they might surge to see how people respond. It might be a bit of a head game, but uh, you know, back in 2013, when Lanny Marchand and I were both going after the Canadian record that was held by Sylvia Ruger for 28 years, uh, we had a pacemaker, um, I think until about 35K, and I remember he stepped off to the side and Lanny took a surge and I thought, oh, it's too early to pick up the pace, but clearly she outsmarted me. She crossed that line ahead of me, uh, both within the record. But, um, you know, she she was pretty smart kind of making that surge. And, and I saw her the rest of that race. She kept that distance the whole time for me. Um, and so, you know, that's something that these athletes will be thinking about today is kind of seeing what the other people around them have, if they can respond when they when they make a move. Yeah, you know. So here's the slight downhill. Here's the slight shade we talked about. Steve Ovet told me a really interesting story. It, it, it's so obvious, but I hadn't really ever thought about it. He said, and obviously he's talking more about the track. Uh, Steve Ovet, the, the Olympic 800 meter champion from, from Moscow, 1980, multiple world record holder middle distance events. He says in some races, it's not necessarily being the fastest, it's who can accelerate the quickest. Because he just, it sounds like a silly point, but it's so obvious when he says it, exactly as you mentioned with Lanny. If on a track, somebody accelerates, even if they only open a gap of a second and a half, if the both athletes in first and second then run the last 400 meters at exactly the same pace, the guy who's managed to accelerate the quickest and produce that second and a half wins the race. So. You know, the, 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 when the move comes, it might be sudden and it might be decisive. The other athletes behind don't need to be broken, but if in the space of 50 meters you open up a 25 meter gap and you then run the rest of the race at the same pace, that's enough. But it's Kibitok on the left trying to pull away from Abraha, and Abraha has got a lot more marathon experience than the Kenyan, and Adane, although he ran that brilliant 205.53 for victory in Barcelona, he's definitely the more hesitant of the trio in this group. He's the one who seems, from the naked eye, to be working hardest to stay with the leading pair. Now, at this point, and there's just shy of 10 kilometers left. The men are predicted at 206.54. The women at 221.51. So we are in the neighborhood of an event record. The neighborhood. 
Just got uh, an update again from uh, Brett Larner with Japan Running News, who said that at the 30K mark, Takechi is now 20 seconds under the qualification. That would indicate he's going to run a mid to high 210s, which would be fantastic for him. This is his 11th marathon, huge PB in Osaka for his 208.57, and that's why he can afford to run a high 210s and still make the cutoff of the average time of under 210 across his two marathons. So Takeuchi running really well at the moment, and he gave himself that chance with a massive PB in Osaka. Good work from him so far. how far behind Malak Kajeta is now. I was just thinking that as we watch Waganesh Makesha on the right, she is the lead woman and she has a sizable advantage. I saw Cam at a, a water station uh, previously, not the elite um, bottles that are, are set up for individual athletes, but uh, just the, the general station, grab a, a little cup of water for her. So, you know, uh, Hopefully she's she's not hurting, but you know definitely it's something that he's you kind know, of keeping his eye on, helping out her out in any way that he can. How much communication can go on between these two at this stage of things when the gap is so wide between one and two? Well, um, I think you know we see Cam looking over his shoulder a lot, so probably he's just gonna you know be aware of, of any um, change that she makes, um, you right. know whether she runs faster and he responds to that, or if he sees that she's dropping off, he's he's going to uh, you know encourage her to, to stick with him. But you can see they're pretty close, you know, um, definitely a, a good partnership here. Checking his watch to make sure that he's he's on pace there, and you know that's another thing he might be telling her is, is what the splits are. She might not even be looking at her watch at all, which is which is a relief to let him do the thinking for her. Sure. They, they just went through uh, 30K in pretty much bang on 141. Now, 140 on the nose is 220.39. They're still on course, I think, for sub 222, bearing in mind that event record is 221.17. So this yeah. is really good running. 221.51, I think, is, is what um, the, the numbers show. course we're you know keeping the the story on Melinda Elmore going after the the Olympic um, standard of 226.50 we're hoping that we can get um, an update in terms of how she's doing with her her pacer Kevin Coffey the all-time event record on the men was set last year Shifara of Ethiopia ran it in 206.04 on the women's side, the mark was set in 2018. Burka of Ethiopia ran it in 2.22.17. So the women right now, Makasha is predicted at 2.21.46. That would break the record if she continues at this pace. The men are just off. They're predicted at 2.07.07 again. The record is 2.06.04. And with a pack of three, there might be a better chance of them getting faster. Sure. You know, because one of them, obviously all three want to win, but that um, would maybe set them up to get closer to that event record. Uh, whereas with the women's side, um, you know, there's no one chasing her or uh, that she's chasing to get that event record. I, I, this, this men's race is becoming absolutely fascinating. Abraha. Tracking Felix Kibitok. Yehudilin Adane is the smallest of the three figures. But he is the fastest of the trio as well. He's run inside 206, where the other two haven't, but he's still there, still very much attached to that group. Adane used to be more of a shorter distance runner, except he found whenever he trained in spikes that he'd have uh, Achilles tendon injuries flare up. 
road, right? The spikes are definitely much different than the, the super shoes of the road. Uh, on the track with spikes, you're, you're up more on your toes, so you can have some injuries or, or issues with your, your lower leg. But um, the, the shoe technology has changed. Um, you know, we were talking before, it's not so much of a story anymore. Everyone's wearing the super shoes, but definitely it improves your running economy. And uh, we've seen faster times. There's no debate that the shoes have, have allowed athletes to, to run faster times. And, um, you know, we're seeing those athletes today wear them um, a higher stack height to them and the carbon fiber plate, um, you know, much different than, than the spikes on the track. But even the, the technology of spikes on the track is changing as well. Yes, in the old days, you know, your calves would ache for days after a 10,000 yeah. 10, meters uh, wearing spikes. But, yeah, Darnay, you know, talking about the athlete in third who appears at times as though he's been struggling to hang on to to the two taller men just in front of him. Sixth in the World Juniors over 10,000 metres back in 2014. He was top 10 in the World Junior cross country the following year in Guiyang in China, which was a, a deceptively testing course. So he's got uh, a fair amount of pedigree on the track and on cross country, but we're looking at the legs of the men in first and second. Felix Kibitov and Gebri Sadik Abraha nothing to separate them. I, I, I wondered whether Abraha was going through a little bit of a bad patch. If he was, I think he looks a little better now. Kibitok still seems to the naked eye to be the freshest of the three. He's, he's got a lovely, smooth action. Talking about the man on the left of picture, the sole Kenyan in this race. But this is really, really interesting because the two Ethiopians are right there with only about, what, 20 minutes or so of running left to go. And uh, in the women's side, we've just received information that there's only a, a gap of 200 meters. That is not significant. So we can't really see that from the cameras, but in a marathon, uh, 200 meters um, definitely can make a, a difference between you know first and second place uh, in the last few kilometers of the race. We've talked about the, the aid stations, and one thing I often like to kind of, um, you know, explain to viewers um, is what's required for these athletes in terms of when they're taking in the fluids and, and their carbohydrates. So, you know, typically when um, it's hotter, you need to take more fluids, electrolytes to replace the sweat that's lost that allows your body to cool. And then the other factor is your, your carbohydrates, which is, you know, your gas in the tank, so to speak. So um, typically for the couple days before the race, you load up on your carbohydrates, your pasta, rice, bread. You know, we saw it in the athlete hotel with, with the food that was provided to help these athletes top up their glycogen stores. And I remember I, I ran the, the math and kind of tried to figure out what these athletes would be taking in during the race. Uh, uh, so it could be, you know, anywhere from 40 to 90 grams of carbs uh, per hour. And, and for the, the person that doesn't know that what that means, that can be like anywhere from 6 to 20 slices of bread in a race. So that's uh, the perspective what they would be taking in. Of course, it's different for every athlete. You have to train your gut just like you train your legs and your lungs and your heart so that your body can get used to digesting that amount of carbohydrates as well as taking the fluid that's required and to stay to stay hydrated. That's a lot of bread. <laughs> <laughs> On the right, the lead woman is Waganish Mekasha of Ethiopia. On the left, it was on the left, it's three racers on the lead men's side. But Mekasha, again, has a top eight major marathon finish on the resume. That was in Chicago last year. We're told it's a 200 meter lead. Although to the naked eye, it certainly seems a lot bigger. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I, I thought it was bigger than that as well. Kibitov just had a little look over his shoulder and a, a Brahma is right there. Adane still attached in third. As for the Canadian, Melindy Elmore, we're told she is 100 meters behind third place. So she's running in fourth. Her pace runner, Kevin Coffey, is out. Well, Makesha has had the company 
of Cam Levins, the North American men's marathon record holder for nearly one hour 49 minutes. He is due to stop at around about two hours and then she will have to do the last 21, 22 minutes or so on her own. But uh, she's had good company from Levins for the last hour and three quarters. Good Canadian hospitality. Ha. It most certainly is that. Everything connected to this race is warm, friendly, inviting and empathetic. All the great qualities that make Canada such a great destination for those of us who come from overseas. So I just got some information on Lindy and if my math is correct, she's on pace for about 227.45 um, maybe. So maybe maybe 227.40. So, um, you know, hopefully she, we don't continue continue to see that, that trend. Maybe she's just in a, a bit of a dip or uh, a bit of a hard patch in the race and we see her rally to, to get back up to that 226.50 um, time to get that Olympic standard. Yeah, because she went through halfway in a time that would have necessitated an absolute uh, nothing lower than a repeat of, of the position she was in. So she didn't really have much of a margin for error to start slowing down. 2.28 the time required for Budapest, 2.26.50 for an automatic spot for Paris for next year. For the men, just to give you an indication, it's a minute and a half difference for those trying to get to Budapest, 2.09.40, and it's 2.08.10 for, uh, for Paris for next year. You know, we've talked a lot about Melindy and the importance of um, keeping that passion and love for the sport, and, you know, it can be difficult when you're going after a time, because as much as you want to just... Um, you know, run within yourself, you do have to keep an eye on your watch. Now, having said that, I've got an interesting little fact about Trevor Hoffbauer when he ran uh, the, the marathon in Toronto with uh, Dana Pereski, who qualified for the Olympics as well in that race on the women's side, uh, the Canadian. Trevor ran against Cam in that race, and everyone had their money on Cam without a watch. And, um, you know, how amazing for him to not only get um, what was required to be qualified for the Olympics, but to, to do it without a watch and to run within himself. Not a common thing, but um, it, it was really interesting to watch that race. That, that's incredible. I, I mean, I, I know some, some athletes approach a race and say, well, I'll just, follow, I'll just follow who's ahead. But to not wear a watch in a marathon, that's amazing. On your right, the lead Canadian woman, Melindy Elmore, who has been the story among the elites. She has moved into third place in this 2023 Ottawa Marathon. And what a run this could be for Elmore, who has her sights set on the Paris Olympics next July. Mother of two. Gave up running for nearly a decade before coming back to the sport. It was when she was inducted into the Okanagan Sports Hall of Fame in 2017 that she realized, hey, I've got a lot left. And made a comeback, competed at the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. And now here she is at the age of 43 doing her thing. Last year finished fourth. In the Toronto Marathon, she was the Canadian champion that day. She is on track to be the Canadian champion today and is presently in third place. Great running from Melindy. Now, I hope very soon we might get another glimpse of the elite men's race because we have had a move. It looks to me we, we, we've, got a, we've got an yeah. off-air monitor, yeah. and it looks to me as though Adane, who seemed as though he was struggling, and he was the one of the three who was always off the back, he's gone to the lead, and for the first time, Felix Kibitok has come under some pressure. So there's the angle. Well, how about that? And you... Yehinolin Adane, who yeah. was off the back, now is the man dictating the rhythm, and Kibitok has been dropped. And this is where it's interesting, because they're back on Sussex Drive, and the, the mantra is you have to suffer through Sussex. 
And tell you what, Kibitok is doing some suffering while Adani is not. And suddenly, this 27 year old Ethiopian is in the lead for the first time today. Oh, that's a bad sign. He's just, he, he, I think he's totally gone. And he looked amazing. He looked like he was feeling really good. But that camera angle, Krista, showing us not only has he been dropped, he's already started looking over his shoulder. This could be a very painful last 12 minutes for Felix Kibitov. Yeah, looking over the shoulder is not always the, uh, an indication that someone's confident. And, um, so back to the Malindi story, which of course things are starting to get exciting for us. Um, her her most recent kilometer was 325, so that is uh, that's a good sign. Wow, how about this from Adane? Camera's just focusing on Waganesh Makesha, who's running behind Cam Levins. Cam Levins due to stop at around about two hours of running. Adane's last four is so consistent. Seven podiums from his 14 marathons. Eight times he's run inside 2.10. And how about this for his last four? 2.06 Dubai, 2.07 Lisbon. And then he's run that 2.05.53 for Barcelona and a 2.07.18 to win in Toronto in October, just gone. Four very, very high quality marathon performances. And now Abraha is also beginning to suffer. 25, 30, 35 meters opening up. Wow. It just shows you, doesn't it? Adane looked like he was struggling out of that leading trio. But now he's got a brilliant opportunity to win yet another marathon here in Canada. And this is mirroring in some ways what happened in Toronto last year where Adane in the final 10K there took over, won by over a minute. And last year was so important for Yehulahan Adane, this 27-year-old Ethiopian. He had the first ever marathon win last May in Barcelona. And Barcelona and Toronto was big for him. He had been tapped as the talented runner who was never able to win a big one. Rob, you mentioned bronze in Lisbon in 21, sixth in Dubai in 2020, but then came Barcelona and the breakthrough in Toronto from there. And could Ottawa be next? Well, it's, it's looking good. If you watch his body language and his cadence and his gait, He's running really strongly here, and Abraha has definitely been dropped. Makesh has been on her own for quite a while in elite women's racing terms, obviously been helped by the pacemaking duty of Cam Levins. We'll keep a close eye on Yehinalin Adane, but he is looking good for another victory in the men's race. And I think within the next uh, couple of minutes, we're going to see Cam... Uh and his duties as pacer. His plan was about two hours, and he's certainly done a phenomenal job. So, you know, hopefully Makesha can continue to push forward um, on her own at this point with uh, the last, you know, probably about seven kilometers that she'll have to do on her own. Be a good story for Adane. He showed us glimpses of his potential with that top six finish at the World Juniors in 2014 and not too far away from the podium with a top 10 in Guiyang, as I mentioned, at the World Cross in 15 in China. No, not really too many signs of fatigue in his, in his style and his gait here. He's having a look at his watch. What a, what a brilliant end to the race this could be for him. Less than 10 minutes to go now. He's he's almost about two minutes off of the the event record, so we might not see that from him today. But uh, what, with the lead women, we can see that uh, the projected projected finish of 2:22:27 is is just 10 seconds slower. Uh, so maybe that's what we we hear Cam, you know, or see him looking to her just to kind of encourage her to go after that uh, event record because he would know what that is. The course is a bit slower than years past. Tony's pasture has been eliminated they've got some more hills than in years prior but fewer turns and there are more gradual hills which has made trying to break that event record such a challenge but at this point Yehulahan Adani in command nearing the two hour mark and the home stretch is on the horizon 
so Cam has uh, ended his pacing duties as we, we just mentioned that he would. And at 35K, we have a time of uh, 158.16. So uh, looking to be like uh, this event record is, is a possibility. Yes. She would need to run 222.17. So 158.16. Yeah, it's going to be close. It's going to be close. It, 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 you know, there won't be much in it. Depends how she can fare over the last 20 minutes or so, running on her own now that Levins has stopped. We were hearing reports. That it was a gap of only 200 meters, but it feels like it's a lot, lot bigger than that. I, well, I can't see that anybody there. in the distance. That look there, there is nothing behind it besides the mist. What a performance this is for Wagonish Nakasha. Distinctive side to side style with her arms. That's but it something. Obviously works. Yeah, that, you know we've talked about many times um, covering the, the marathons and running that um, you know you can be kind of an ugly runner and not look so efficient and smooth, but um, that doesn't matter. You know, Paula Radcliffe kind of had the head bob and didn't look so comfortable and relaxed, but she had that world record for so many years. And uh, clearly her, her running style and, and gait, the way she did it uh, and the way it looked, didn't seem to matter. That must feel, I, I don't know what that's like, that must feel amazing to be, to be in control of your race, to know that you're feeling good if she is, and to be thinking, 20 minutes away from a massive major marathon title and I've got this road all to myself. It must be a great feeling. And Adane's looks like he's in the same boat. Seven minutes from the finish line. The gap widening and lengthening for the Ethiopian. It was a pack of three for the majority of this race. And then all of a sudden in the last three kilometers, four kilometers, it's Adane who's taken over. And there's, you know, a lot that he could have been taking in, uh, running with the other two, how they're breathing, how they're responding to, um, you know, pulling off and getting their drinks. Sometimes that just kind of interrupts your rhythm and, and you know, your, your comfort level. So he may have been kind of just noticing those things um, as he went. Now he's, he's taking his bottles there quite smooth the way he grabbed that. And, uh, you know, typically you carry it for, for a little bit, take some sips, let your stomach uh, digest it rather than a big gulp all at once, and then toss it to the side that were, uh, you know, collected by the many volunteers that are out there today. Well, just behind our commentary position is the finish line, and there's a whole phalanx of photographers, medical oh. assistants, and camera crews. Two kilometers to go. Re ready to capture the image of the leading athlete coming across the line. What a hat-trick of titles this would be. Barcelona and Toronto last year, and Ottawa this year. It would be three in a row for the man who performs so well as a junior on the track and in cross-country. He fooled us all. Kipitop was the one who looked comfortable in that triumvirate of excellence, but Adane was biding his time, watching and waiting for his moment to strike, and when he did so, it was definitive. He's on Colonel By Drive now, next to Pretoria Bridge, then up Queen Elizabeth Drive to the finish line. Looks to be just off the event record pace, though. Looks about uh, 2.08.10 is what they're expecting him to finish. So that's about two minutes off of the event record. But um, a victory, like you said, would certainly be uh, an, an amazing accomplishment. He's, yeah, he's, he's been really consistent over the last sort of 15, 16 months or so. Not raced 
in 2023. So the last time we saw him, well, he's going to start thinking that Canada's his lucky omen with victory in Toronto. And now, barring an attack of cramp or something unforeseen occurring, it's going to be an excellent victory on the streets of Otto. And he still looks, you know, there's not too much tension in those shoulders. He's not rocking and rolling. He, he looks pretty comfortable, I think. I know in the past we've talked about uh, the Ethiopians. There's a restaurant. I can't recall if it's in Toronto or Ottawa. There's probably one of both that uh, they like to go to and celebrate with the, the local Ethiopians, you know, to eat the food that, that, um, that they quite enjoy and to have those flags. So uh, perhaps that's in the works right now, the planning for a post-race celebration ah. for Ethiopia. Off the Pretoria Bridge, one mile to the finish line. And it'll actually be interesting to see what's going on behind him. I know we can't glimpse that from this moment, but Kibitop, when he was dropped, looked like he was beginning to really struggle, and so too Abraha. So it's not guaranteed that those two will finish in second and third they might do but uh, as anyone will tell you when the wheels come off in a marathon they do so in spectacular fashion you you can end up in a situation where you feel like you can't put one foot in front of the other and so we'll those have to keep marathons yeah. where uh, you know whether it's stomach issues or you went out too hard or it's hot or whatever when you are struggling and there's still so much to go it seems like for for, you know, it seems like you're running 84 kilometers. So, yeah. you know, he's looking strong, and that's definitely what you want is to feel good at the end, right? Sometimes you're just suffering to get to the line, and that's all you can do. But um, a sweet victory where you're feeling good is is kind of um, you know a double win. looks like he's picking up his pace a little bit now that he knows the victory is assured he just wants to try and come home with as solid a time as possible what was he 207 18 when he won in toronto he ran 205 53 for his barcelona win so it's not going to be a personal best but that, that doesn't matter this has been this has been a really classy field and it's been a very very cleverly run race by Yehuna Linadani. This really clever. Oh, now we start to see the, the crowds gathering, and he'll get a, an absolute guard of honor when he comes in towards the finish. Remember, 200,000 people take to the streets of Ottawa across this Tamarack race weekend to support not only the Canadian athletes, but the internationals as well. And they're witnessing a wonderful, wonderful performance here by a man who is making winning a habit over this most grueling and testing of distances. This will be three in a row. Madani's trained with uh, Getchu, who was third at Tokyo, as well as Ymir, who was third at Boston. So uh, two world major podium finishers are his uh, teammates. So I'm sure they're they're you know excited to be watching this and cheering on their their teammate who's going to have his own victory. Well, how sweet the sound of the crowd must be now, ringing in the ears of Yehinalin Adane. He hung on to the leaders when it looked like he was beginning to struggle. But he has run a masterful race here. And the crowd are really getting excited and getting behind him. And now he begins to pick up his pace. Now he begins to celebrate. Joy etched on his face, arms raised aloft. Victories in Barcelona. Toronto last year and look at this sprint finish it's going to be a golden end to a great race here in Ottawa for Yehina Linajane he is the Ottawa champion for 2023 and he has done that in fine fine style what a run and what a victory for the young Ethiopian towards the 
finish. This has been a solid performance from him. It's not as quick as he would have liked. He ran that low 206 in Dubai. He has won a few marathons, Marrakesh, Prague, and Guangzhou. He was consistent throughout, throughout the morning. He was right there with the, with the top three. And you're saying to yourself, is he waiting? Is he lurking? His teammate there is going back the other way with the flag. But he is delighted. That is a great second place finish for Abraha. It's not the victory he was perhaps hoping for, but he managed to hang on. So it's an Ethiopian 1-2 as the cameras focus back on Waganesh Makesha, who is perhaps, perhaps beginning to look like she was slowing for the first time. And speaking of slowing, uh, she's now on course for just outside 223. I wondered whether Kibitok might be able to hang on for third, and it looks as though if, yeah, if we are focusing on the athlete in third, it's the man who was second 12 months ago, who looks as though he's come past uh, Felix Kibitok. I tell you what, Adane looks fresh enough to run another 5K. <laughs> Felix Kibitok, it was that look over his shoulder so soon after he'd been dropped that led you to think he could run into major problems uh, in that last 5K. But Abdi Ali Gelchu looks as though he's coming home for another podium finish, one he enjoyed last year. Came through very, very late for a 209.44 to finish second. But this is another good run. He's outside 2.10. But coming across the line to complete an Ethiopian 1-2-3. He's on the podium once again, as he was a year ago. We've got Alan Brooks there uh, assisting the athletes as they come across the line, making sure that the the uh, appropriate flags are given to the athletes. Uh, Steve Anderson there, who's involved uh, with uh, much of this organization of the race with the elites of Dylan Wikes uh, to get this picture with their flags. So, uh, you know, good photo opportunity for, um, you know, the photographers that are there. Of course, this is what we're going to see um, online and in the papers and whatnot uh, when we see the top three men. And I just wonder where Felix Kibitok is, if he's, if indeed he's still going. Ah, the warm embrace between the Ethiopians and their team. So let's let's think about the pattern that we've seen from Adani in Ontario, in Canada, over the last year. Final 10K in Toronto last October. He was absolutely aces. He took off from the pack and won, won that race by over a minute. Now here today, it was in the final 10K where he absolutely took off to win this race. You wonder what it is down the stretch, what he has left in the tank to do it each time. He's obviously learned how to read a marathon, and he's learned how his body feels in that last few kilometers. He's maturing into a great, great marathon runner. And it might not be long before he lowers that 205.53 PB uh, that he produced last year in Barcelona. This looks like it's, is this Banty? In which case, the wait for Felix Kibitok goes on. Achu Banty, who is a 206 performer at his best. Four of his last five, he's run inside 208. So it's an indication as to how tough these conditions have been that he's going to come home in a roundabout low 213s. It's been a, uh, a solid effort, but Felix Kibitok, who was leading for quite a while, still hasn't been seen at the finish, and there he is on the right of picture. And that's the American uh, coming through, Parker Stinson, running well. All credit to Felix Kibitok for finishing. Cameras jumping around. It's Banty who's just finished, the 27-year-old uh, Ethiopian. Felix Kibitok is on the left, just about managing to keep going with Parker Stinson, who was 11th in Chicago a few years ago. 
looking over his shoulder. Kibitok on the left, Parker Stinson on the right. 2.10.53 is his PB. Keeps looking over his shoulder. He's kicking. He wants to get uh, ahead there. One, one place ahead. And he him. will. Yep. It's a strong finish. Looking over his shoulder to make sure that someone's not trying to outkick him. For some First in the, the 25K in the championships 10. for the USA Parker in 2019. The US uh, personal best of 2.10.53. He was fourth at the Houston Marathon in 2023 and 12th uh, at the Houston Half Marathon in 2019. Parker Stinson. One thing that's interesting about Stinson, he said, I found success in the pain zone. He said, I've really had to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, that's, that's a line that I use all the time, too, and it's so true, right? You have to be uh, comfortably uncomfortable. That was a good run by him coming home inside 214. So tough for some of these athletes. I mean, these, these are world-class men we're watching here, and one or two of them just, just struggling to get over the finish line. There's uh, Lee Waselia, so it looks like he would be our, our lead Canadian. It looks like, um, you know, he's he's doing quite well. We talked before about how he doesn't like to run in the heat, and he, he adjusts his pace accordingly, but um, like we said, the, the weather hasn't turned out to be as hot as we thought it might be, so good to see him pushing. Of course, you know, he looks like he's, he's in a bit of pain, but hopefully he... He can, you know, take a look at that finish line, and that's what gets him to the end. He is a large animal veterinarian who practices about 45 minutes from the finish line here in Ottawa. Oh, you can tell he's really having to work for this. Come on, Lee, keep going. Plenty of cowbells on the side of the course as the Cameras focus in on Waganesh Makesha on the right of picture. I don't think this is going to be an event record now, but it could well be an excellent victory for the woman who won Singapore back in 2014, has been on the podium on six occasions in total across her 12 marathons, but this would be one of the most significant days of her career, the 31-year-old. This has been a, a brilliant, brilliant run. And I, I think we haven't got a clear indication, but I think she's miles clear of those in second right, and third, I think miles so. clear. You know, I think that uh, her pace has dropped. She's she's almost at about 224 now. So that's, um, you know, close to close to two minutes off of the event record. And, you know, she slowed when Cam Levens left, but that's also the point in the race where it starts to hurt more anyway. So, you know, credit to Cam and the pacing, but it definitely gets difficult. One of the subplots of today was that we were looking forward to seeing whether the Japanese athletes could make their way into their trial race, but in fact, none of them have done so. We got indications early on that Asaki and Takeuchi and Ono were on course to just about get themselves into the Japanese Olympic trial with that combined time of 2.10 across two races, but none of them uh, have managed to do that as we watch Wasselius on the left trying to get himself home as the lead Canadian as the leading woman edges her way closer towards the finish. I think that was Matsuo who just um, who just finished, so he would be the first from Japan, but oh, difficult for them to not get what they came for. No, he, needed, he needed a 2.10.12, and he's uh, a long way shy of that. Well, you can tell how tired Lee Wasselius is getting because look at the way his legs yeah. are yeah. moving out. To, yeah, this is a really uncomfortable-looking style, and, and when you're super fatigued, it's the style that starts to go. That right leg is really kicking out and rather sometimes, than going back in a straight line. It, exactly. Sometimes that's all you can do is to focus on how you're running to get to the line so that it's, it's that much easier. Um, 
Bank. So um, good for him, though. Uh, looks like he's he's not far off uh, his personal best of 218.41. So still a, a solid race for him. You know, he's looking over his shoulder. Uh, we can see that the Canadian flags are, are coming out for, for him. And of course, Melinda Elmo that we're expecting to see soon. So he's crossing the line. First Canadian, Lee Wasalius. Uh, good performance for him today. Um, and a personal best. Good for him. Yeah, good running from Vesalius. Getting a cooling bit of water on his back. And perhaps for the first time, we're now getting an indication as to the fatigue setting in for Makesha. She worked very, very hard to establish a really big lead but you can tell now she is really hurting. Yeah, we saw that with Lee coming in, and perhaps we had his, his personal best time wrong. It was maybe... Uh, yeah, he a, ran a, he, he, he a 21641 in Indianapolis, right. but it's still one of the best oh, times for sure. he's ever yes, produced, yes. without question. And uh, the marathon is a, is a beast. It is so hard, the last 7K. You want to just finish feeling okay, not, not terrible. So, you know, it takes some real solid energy to dig deep emotionally. There we've got... Um, Melindy Elmore, who we've been following throughout the, this race, hoping that, that she uh, finishes. We're hoping to get a more accurate uh, update in terms of what her projected finish time is to see if she's within that 226.50 um, to make the Olympic standard for the, uh, the Paris Olympics in 2024, or the Olympics in Paris. Well, she's looking good. I think Makesha is really feeling the effects of that surge that pulled her away from Milak Kajeta, who was with her for the first hour or so, but then when she got dropped, it was also quite definitive. Melinda grabbing her bottle there. That was a good catch. Uh, one thing that uh, she's she's well known for is, is running along the rail. I know when we uh, called the marathon, you know, we could hardly see her on the screen because she was over on the side, and that's probably all those years of running around the track in the 1500, which was her specialty uh, many years ago. Encouragement being shouted to Waganesh Makesha just needs to keep this going to secure an excellent victory on the streets of Ottawa and turn it into an Ethiopian day of double delight. It's like she's on pace right now for about 224.36, so definitely has slowed uh, in the last 7K or so, uh, but, you know, I don't think that there's any uh, risk of her not winning today. She had a big enough cushion, didn't she? Beautiful place to go for a run down by the canal and a very leafy city as well. This is a fantastic backdrop. One or two people out in the deck chairs sitting on their own drives <laughs> watching world-class distance runners, male and female, taking the kids for a, an early morning stroll on a Sunday. Keeping her head perfectly still, not too much rocking and rolling in the upper body. And it won't be long before she senses the finish line and as the energy grows and she'll hear the booming music on the PA system. She's trying to follow in the footsteps of some fabulous champions and this is a great run i mean the, the course record was set by galetta burka burka was a world indoor champion over 1500 a world cross country champion a world championship silver medalist on the track over 10,000 meters tigis tufa has got the second quickest time of 224 and a half she won the london marathon in 2015 so makesha is trying to follow in the footsteps of some fabulous Ethiopian women who've come here and won this title in a great time. So 
This is going to be a wonderful performance, even if it isn't going to be the event record it was scheduled to look like, judging by her pace a little earlier in the race. And at this point, Rob, you think about the history of this event, the 2023 Tartan Auto International Marathon. The question becomes, will she be the third fastest ever? I, I would think so, because third is Abera Mercuria, who ran 225 and a half in 2015, although it does depend on, she is clearly slowing down. You, yeah. you can see it, but it's a question of by how much. But it's certainly, it's going to be a, a, a great victory for her. And again, we talked about Adane in the men's race, having a little bit of pedigree, having run so well over 10,000 meters as a junior. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same with Makesha, Africa junior bronze over 3,000 meters quite a while ago when she was a, a youngster and just off the podium in the World Cross as a junior in 2011. So she's got great history and great pedigree in her running CV. And now for the first time in a little while, we see a metaphorical and literal spring in the step of Waganesh Makesha picking up her pace, soaking up the applause from the crowd. She's just being guided home here. And those who've turned out on the streets of this great city have witnessed a real treat, a wonderful performance, a great run. That is the third fastest time we've ever seen from an elite woman on the streets of Ottawa. Waganesh Makesha takes the title. That was a tough, tough, tough last 10K. She did the damage to everyone else and herself at the halfway stage, but she had the stamina and the heart to hang on, and she takes the title. We won't forget this performance in Ottawa for quite some years to come. Who's there to greet her at the finish line? Fellow Ethiopian, fellow... Who knows what she's been through? <laughs> she was really, really feeling that towards the back end of the race, but this is an excellent end to the race here for Melindy. She's looking really solid. She almost looks like she's sprinting there. That's great acceleration. I mean, she might be she might be disappointed because she's clearly not going to run the qualifying time for Paris. But she is on her way to beating some very, very classy women in this race. I still think this has been a an excellent run from Melindy. I mean, she sets herself really, really high standards. But she's she's on her way potentially here. We can't be 100% sure. She's on her way, I think, to finishing in second I think place. So too. Yes. And that, that is a great run. Oh, for sure. That's One spot off run. of uh, the top podium spot is is incredible for today, and especially if she didn't get that standard to to say that she was second um, with an international field at the Auto Marathon is certainly something that she can be proud of. You think of how this race began Amazing. with Melissa and Camilla and Nakasha. They, they were on our radar. And now Melinda, what? The resume just continues to grow. Yeah. For sure. I mean, look at that solid finish. Um, she's found something at the end. And, um, you know, she's, she's really pushing it here. She's just going to be off that. This, this is a great run from the 43-year-old Melindy Elmo, the former Olympian over 1,500 metres. Yes, by her own very high standards, she might be a bit disappointed that she's missed out on the qualifying time for Paris. But she's finishing the Ottawa Marathon here in second place, inside 228. That was a brilliant run. She's come through so well to deny Malak Kajeta 
the second place finish. That is a wonderful run from Melindy Elmore. Yes, OK. She'll have to come back and run 2.26.50 on another day, but she cannot be disappointed with that. So often she runs so well in the marathons. Great runs in Houston in 2019 and 2020. A brilliant run in the Olympic marathon in Sapporo. She's had a fourth in Toronto with 2.25. She was 11th in Boston with 2.27, and she's second here in Ottawa with another brilliant, brilliant performance, still delivering at the highest level, now comfortably into her 40s. I think she should be really, really proud of that performance, even if she hasn't got the qualified time for Paris. That's a little guy there, Oliver, giving his, his mom a hug. I'm sure she's, you know, sitting up to... Uh, you know, hold that flag up that she can hold with so much pride. And there, her dad, uh, Graham Hood, who also placed ninth at the Olympics uh, in the 1500. He's a two-time Olympian. Uh, you know, probably telling him, "Mom's okay. She's all right. She's just really tired. She had a hard day at, at work." So he's uh, going to be, you know, in a lot of those race pictures with his mom. We're clearly proud of her. Mom says, "Always a great, great, great hand-eye coordination." And, uh, and of course, we, you know, have to mention Charlie, who yes. uh, big brothers at home. Uh, uh, he'll be watching, I'm sure, probably with Grandma or Grandma uh, back in BC. And, and there's Ollie with his mom. So that's the same little guy that, uh, like I said before, that she was, you know, breastfeeding shortly after she finished in, in Houston back when he was seven months old. So, you know, what a special um, moment here for them to share. And yeah, she might be disappointed, but uh, I mean, hey, what a performance for her to run so fast at the end for a little guy to come hug her. And uh, we haven't seen her stand up yet, but I'm sure we will soon. She was exhausted. She crossed that line and just collapsed. Well, I, you know, we weren't able to see it, but I'm sure oh, a hug and kiss from uh, her husband and coach, Graham Hood, very proud of her. But I'm sure that she probably kicked in the end to get that second place spot. We weren't able to see it with the cameras, but that's probably what, you know, pushed her to the edge uh, with, with that, you know, exhaustion as she crossed the line. Here she is coming out, um, showing us the Canadian flag, of course, again, Canadian uh, champion, first one to, to cross the line for Canada. And, uh, second place finish right for this race today for the women. Really, really good run that from Elma. I'm, I'm, I'm glad she's smiling because I wanted, you know, because she sets I'm glad such she's high standards. Yeah, she sets such high standards for herself. I wondered whether she would be, you know, berating herself for not coming home inside 226.50. But she absolutely could tell that Kajeta was there for the taking, and she must have overtaken her al almost within sight of the finish. That was that was tight, and that is why she was sprinting. That's A great that way to. That 1500 meter speed maybe came back and we saw her again <laughs> running along the, the side there like she did for those years. So that's clearly what her, works for her. And, you know, even if she knew she wasn't getting the standard, if she had someone to chase to get that second place spot, what, what more reason to give a push when she could? And clearly we saw that exhaustion at the end that it paid off. So Elmore finishes second. She is the top Canadian on the women's side. The top Canadian on the men's side, Lee Wasalius, is with her Derek Finch. Lee Wasselius is the top Canadian, and he joins me right now. Lee, uh, how did you feel about that run out there? Walk me through it. Yeah, so uh, uh, I was feeling really good up until, I see, 30, 35K. And like, uh, my goal today was uh, just to be top Canadian and finish under 220, just for, because that's what the prize money gets have. So I just, we were running with uh, two of my training partners, and so us three Canadians were all in that lead group, and we we're through maybe what, about 218 pace or so. And, I was feeling pretty good, and then that last like five, seven k, things started to hurt and slowed a little. But I just managed to stay on pace and managed to, I think, go under, uh, I think, two eighteen mid or so. So I was happy with that. I accomplished all I wanted to accomplish today. So I figured a fast time was uh, off the tables just with the weather and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Explain to us how does that heat affect you as a runner, Lee? Yeah. So like your kind of ideal temperature marathon, I don't know, six to ten degrees or so, and just the, the hotter and hotter it gets, just the kind of the, the more you overheat, the more energy you waste, and just the harder it gets. And then also too with the sun out, that it's like solar radiation and stuff. And that just, uh, just kind of wears you down at the end. So you gotta play careful. Like, you don't, you don't want to be feeling good at 30K because if you're already hurting then, it's, it can make that last 10K really tough. You always have to say in that the uh, first 20 miles is a warm up, and then the last 10K is a race. So uh, I felt that today, so for sure. Uh, what about the fans? They help you out there. Uh, a lot of a lot of people lining up uh, along this route. Yeah, it was definitely great. Uh, 
a lot of people seem to know my name, so uh, it, uh, it's definitely nice motivation, especially as you're hurting the, that last like 7K or so. It's just nice to kind of get that little bit of support and stuff. And it was also nice too, because a few other guys I was reeling in, so it gives you just a little bit of a extra adrenaline uh, to make it to the finish line. How you be celebrating this this accomplishment today? Uh, probably have a couple beers and take a nice week or two off and kind of plan for uh, the next one, I guess. Well, what, what's next for you, Lee? I still have to figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm probably going to do a fall marathon. Uh, I have no races on the dock right now. I was originally going to do a 10K in Toronto in a few weeks because I won it last year, but I figured after switching to the marathon, uh, that's off the table. So, so we'll just kind of recover and then see what uh, lines up, I guess. Excellent. Well, congratulations and enjoy those beers. Thanks. I'll try. There you have it. Uh, the top Canadian. Back to you, Arash. Derek, he is a proud Maritimer, and he is the top Canadian at this 2023 Tartan Ottawa International Marathon. Congratulations to Lee Wasalius. As the thousands are still on the streets of our national capital, as the race continues to go on, we welcome you to our studio at the finish line with Krista Duchesne and Rob Walker and Marash Madani. I tell you what, um, we had ourselves a race today. We had ourselves some surprises today. And there are so many good stories. But to me, what we saw from Melinda Elmore is remarkable. To not only finish as the top Canadian, but finish second overall in this marathon when you consider the quality of runners that were, that were there at the starting line, for Elmore to finish second is outstanding. And, and like I said, you know, she has been so successful. I think at this point in her career, it's all about gratitude. It's, yeah. You know, she's accomplished so much, ran at the Olympics in Tokyo, and then again, like we mentioned, back in 2004 in Athens. And, and you know, she, she has that surge at the end to get second place. We see her collapse on the grass at the finish line, you know, clearly pushed herself to the limit, and then her little guy comes up and, you know, sees that mom's okay. And um, that's perspective, right? She, she did so well. And and, and that's that's what her life is is the love of the, her family around her as she you know continues to work after her dreams really really good performance i was i was so impressed with that you know and, and when you put that together because this is a whole race weekend when you put her second place finish together with tash wodak's win yesterday bouncing back from her disappointment at not being able to compete in london two, Canadians, two canadian women one two at, good friends yep, one at 43 one at 41 proving you can still deliver at the highest level and what a great story it would be we don't know if this will play out yet because that's the that's the delight of live sport but they're both still running so well wouldn't it be amazing if they ended up becoming teammates next year in Paris. I know Melindy has to find the extra seconds and Natasha has to do that again, but the signs are really good for both of them. Two fantastic performances. They did it two years ago in Tokyo as teammates at the Olympics for Canada. Congratulations to Waganesh Nakasha of Ethiopia who won the women's race. As for the men's side, what a race this was that appeared to be neck and neck. Well, it was neck and neck through the first 30 kilometers when all of a sudden Yehulahan Adane took over down the stretch in the last 10 kilometers. Uh, the way Adane took that race was so, so impressive because he looked at one stage as though he was hanging on to Felix Kibitok and Abraha, who looked set for a big duel. Adane was dropping off the pace and then he was coming back. The times largely run. I mean, 208.22, he's run quicker, Adane, but he's on a trajectory of greatness at the moment because he's won his third marathon in succession. Barcelona, Toronto, and now Ottawa. Abraha, a good second place. Gelchu, who finished third in 210.38. Remember, he came through late to finish second uh, last year, so a second successive podium for him. Banty and Stinson coming through to deny Kibitok a fourth place finish because the wheels really came off from the Kenyan who was looking poised and composed as he led the race for much of it. Disappointment, we should mention the two Japanese athletes who finished in the top 10, but disappointment from their point of view because they traveled all the way here to Ottawa for the opportunity 
to try and put a fast time on the board and earn themselves a place in the Olympic trials race. And they haven't been able to do that. But Takeuchi and Suzuki both do go home with a top 10 finish from Ottawa. But Adane was just fantastic. And they say, Krista, and they say, Arash, that winning becomes a habit and that's the habit he's gone into. Three marathons in a row. I don't care what time you're running those in. Mm. That's fantastic because, as Krista knows, it's so easy for something to go wrong in a marathon. So to win three on the spin is a very, very big achievement. And you think about he had kind of the reputation as such a talented runner who could never win the big one for so long. You know, he finished with the bronze in Lisbon in 21, sixth in Dubai in 20, and then came the breakthrough in Barcelona, where he set the course record there with a personal best. Then he delivered in Toronto again, and at 27 years old, it appears, Krista, he's in the prime of his career. And I think it's safe to say that Canada would probably be one of his favorite countries, uh, if he's asked. <laughs> oh, without any question, you know, going, going back to back. Uh, Toronto and Ottawa. Yeah, I, I, I think I think he'll be returning and he'll be he'll be getting a few invites. I would think after the two brilliant performances he's put in here over the last eight or nine months or so. Uh, we heard from Lewis Alias earlier with Derek Fage out there. Let, let's speak about the top Canadian male for just a moment. Um, he came in with the hopes of of this of, of being the top Canadian. I thought it was really interesting, he said, when I was running on fumes, when I had nothing left in the tank, he said some of the people in the crowd really were instrumental in getting him over the hump. Right, and they were calling his name, and, and yeah. that certainly is an encouragement when you just, you know, you feel like giving up sometimes, but, you know, you never you never quit. So I think that was definitely helpful for him. And and he said it, he, his goal was to be under 220 because that's the, the cutoff for the prize money, and um, he knew he wasn't going to be accomplishing anything fast for, for what he was maybe capable of. But, um, you know, good for him to, to push in the end, to get under that time. And, and you know, holding out that Canadian flag is, is always something something that, that you can be proud of, that no one can ever take that away. You've got those pictures with the flag. Uh, those are special memories to hold for a lifetime. Well, and, and he's having a good year because he broke his half marathon PB in Vancouver earlier this year. And we've mentioned a, 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 a few times about the fact that he's a big animal vet. You know, this is a guy with a tremendously demanding day job. Yes. And he's still performing at a level high enough to be the number one Canadian male in your number one prestigious marathon. So, you know, he's he's got a, he's juggling a lot. I know he, he, he said, oh, I might have a few beers and a, and a couple of weeks off. I think he should do because, you know, he's going to be back to the day job. Maybe he'll have a day Monday off. Monday morning. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow morning or, or, or maybe, they'll, uh, maybe they'll give him Monday off. But that's a great performance. Look, he's, he's never going to win the Olympic gold medal, Lee Wasalius. He's not in that level and he knows it, but... You know, he is making the very best of the talent he's got. And what a great example he is of somebody who's balancing a tremendously difficult job that, that's taken him seven years of training to get to and still coming out here and feeling like a champion, feeling like the top dog in his own country, uh, which he was today. Which is amazing. You know, he said, look, there's six runners ahead of me in the World Championship Olympic conversation. He said, I'm not quitting that day job to come do this. But the payoff came today. It also came for Yehulahan Adani, the winner of this 2023 Tartan Ottawa International Marathon. I'm here with the men's winner. Walk us through that race. How did you feel out there? Uh, Okay. Uh, the race was fine, but uh, after uh, after halfway, it was getting a bit warmer, and uh, the course was a bit modified. That was tough. Also, the competition by itself with other athletes was strong. Uh, so all in all, it was a good race. He, he was running with a couple of guys there for quite a while and then made a move. Tell us about that move and, and, and the decision to make it at that time. 
አብሮ ከነበሩት ጥቂት አትሌቶች ጋር ከሁለቱ አትሌቶች ጋር መጨረሻ ላይ ከሩስ ትትሮት ነበርና በመጨረሻ ላይ የነበረው ሂደት እንዴት ነው ለሞታት ወሰንክበት ሁኔታ አስረተን አው እስከ 200 ኪሎ ሜትር ድረስ ተፎካካሪና አቅም ለማየት ያው ያለ የሥራው ሂደት ነው ከኋላ ነበር የጓደኞች ክብተና ትልየው ነበር ከ200 ኪሎ ሜትር ሲቀር ያው ለውድድሩ ለማሸነፍ ነው ስንጓድ ያለው ተፎካካሪ ለማየት በጎን ሰውጣ ትንሽ እንደሱ እንደበዛላሉ Yeah, so that that you always have to look the situation of your competitors so I was in kind in that kind of situation and then in a few kilometers from the finish when I try to pull out and then I see them not responding so I I keep moving uh, what's he going to do to celebrate this this win <laughs> there is nothing special but i had a good support from the public and then this is my second win in canada because uh, I win Toronto Marathon in October. So everything was good for me. So I would like to thank you, the public and the organizers. Nice. Can we expect him back here again next year? Yes, I will come happily. Excellent. Congratulations. Really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Uh, there you have it, the winner on the men's side. Back to you, Arash. And Derek, that is great news that Adani is interested, willing to come back again next year to defend his title, doing it so emphatically along the canal in the national capital region. It began just by City Hall, went into Gatineau, came back across the Alexandra Bridge and into the, into the city and to the finish line. Arash Badeni alongside Olympian Krista Duchesne and Rob Walker. Uh, when you think about that men's race, there was one Kenyan who was in this race. There was one Kenyan who was leading this race. There was one Kenyan we thought was going to win this race. And then all of a sudden, Felix Kivotow, what happened? Well, it, it, it goes back to that old adage that looks can be deceiving. I mean, one of the reasons I was so looking forward to seeing him was because he's run that 59.08. He still hasn't replicated at the marathon what he's done at the half marathon. He looked comfortable, but when the questions were asked by Adane, he failed to find the answer. Credit to him for not giving up and for finishing. I mean, he's, he was wobbling all over the place and finished just outside 2.14. Parker Stinson coming past him like a steam train. But, but Krista knows it can take some athletes a very, very long time to work out their relationship with a marathon. Kibitok is clearly very, very talented, but he hasn't quite fully figured this out. Even though he's run a 2.06 in the past, he hasn't quite got there yet, has he? Well, and Adani said in his interview, he was reading, kind of reading the crowd, reading the people he was competing against, and he said they didn't respond. And so that just shows that, you know, he was definitely paying attention to the people around him. Sometimes you can be hurting yourself, but if the other people around you are hurting more, that's your key to move. Well, it's Adani who wins the Ottawa Marathon on the men's side. Waganesh Makesha, a 31-year-old, Fellow Ethiopian wins it on the women's side. She is with her Derek Page. Here with the winner on the women's side. Uh, tell us uh, how you're feeling out there. Uh, you you ended up getting quite a gap between yourself and the and the other runners. How did you manage to do that? Yeah. The, the race was uh, good for me, but it was a bit uh, uphill, uh, close to the finish. Uh, apart that, oh, oh, it was all fine. 
Did, did the heat affect you at all out there, and then how so? I'm um, going to test the massage drawfish not better. No, not at all. <laughs> it was good, she said, yeah. Um, when, when you prepare for a race like this, did she prepare any differently, knowing she's coming here to Ottawa and had a chance to look at the route, and, and what, what did she do to prepare? No, the drus is a guy who has a lot of work. She 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 has a lot yeah, I prepared well for this race, but I don't have a chance to see the running course. I only have a chance to see it on the map. What's uh, what's the next uh, race for? What is she looking at coming up next? Uh, yeah. yeah, I have no, I, I have no clue about that yet. Yeah. How, how will you celebrate this particular race? Yeah, in the delicious day, no, the station will take over you. In the no, the station will take over you. Yeah, as yet, the day I go out, the next game, the other game, I get a lot. Yeah, there's nothing special I'm gonna do, but I'm so happy for the winning the race. Well, congratulations! Thank you so much for this. Yeah. She said thank you. Well, there you have it, guys. Uh, there's our winner. Back to you, Arash. Derek, thank you. Waganesh, thank you. 224.47. Good for first place in the elite women's field today for the Ethiopian, finishing second. Canada's Melinda Elmore. We weren't sure what to expect in the women's race coming into this. Ayana Melissa of Ethiopia was in the conversation. Ayantu Camella of Ethiopia was in the discussion. And then it was Natasha who really kind of set herself apart in the second half of the race. It was, it was a really good race to watch because very quickly we got down to just two with Makasha and Kajeta, and Kajeta was coming back for her first marathon after, after having her daughter, who has delighted everyone uh, in the Athletes Hotel, beautiful little girl, and, and apparently her husband was taking the baby to the halfway stage, so I wonder whether, whether they saw each other uh, in, in the heat of the moment, but it looked like it was going to be a two-way battle, but as soon as Makesha made her move, Kajeta was broken straight away. I mean, she did really well to hang on for third in the end because Melindy came steaming past her for second. But when she went to the front and made that decisive break, there was so much strength behind that. And that's why we were getting excited about a potential event record because she was on course for 2.21 and then it was low 2.22s. In the end, she's drifted to just inside 225. But we do need to remind ourselves that's the third fastest time we've ever seen sure. from an elite female in, in the, the, in the history of the event. Yeah, yeah, absolutely brilliant. And you know, she's she's given herself an opportunity to take another step up in class because she's been around a long time. She won the Singapore Marathon, I think, in 14. But this is on a different level to that, and it's almost 10 years later. All of a sudden, she's in a different type of conversation where when her agent's putting her chips in the uh, in the game, they're suddenly going, oh, hang on, you've won the Ottawa Marathon. That, that That's really impressive. And she's beaten a world-class field to do it. But I think it was, it was two things. It was having the confidence and the determination to make that break. And secondly, it was also hanging on to the strength to keep going because she was undoubtedly feeling that towards the end. But she didn't completely will. She came home inside 225 and won the race by over two and a half minutes. That's impressive. And it was interesting in the conversation with Derek. She said she's never run the race before, or she didn't run the track before, or know the course at all before, other than what she effectively saw on her phone. But she knew where to pounce and where to go on the attack, which is the most important thing. Still. For, for sure, when you make your move, you need to do it with confidence. And I don't think once we saw her look over her shoulder, so that was a clear indication that she knew she had this. And, you know, she obviously benefited from having Cam Levins pace her for the 35K about two hours and, and slowed a bit. But, you know, she had a sizable lead and, and she wasn't going to lose that. And, you know, looking at the times here, we saw Melindy finish with complete exhaustion and, and she definitely 
surge to, to catch up to get that second place finish. And I think she only did it by five seconds. So that's definitely why we saw her completely exhausted at the end. But, you know, to go from a bronze to a silver is, is, is a phenomenal accomplishment for her to be, you know, just up from the podium. An all-out sprint to the finish line to get that silver medal. And Elmore with our Derek Page. What a race, second place and the top Canadian, Melindy Elmore joining me. Melindy, walk me through that race. Well, you, <laughs> you've been smiling since you came across that finish line. I'm just happy to be done. <laughs> it's a long ways to run. It's almost like there's um, many races within the race. It's 42K and you have to break it down. So the first half, the whole time I'm just thinking it's the warm up. Just go relax, keep it easy. You keep conserve as much energy as possible, even emotionally. Like I just don't try, I try not to think very much, turn it off. And then around 30K is kind of when the race starts. You have 12K to go, and that's when people start to come back to you. Um, I caught two women around 30K, and I, my pacers um, stepped off then as well, so I was all alone. And um, your body just starts to get into a different level of, of pain around then where your legs are, it's harder to lift your legs, but you can still push hard. Um, and that, like the last 10K is when I start to think of this as a race and I'm trying to catch people and um, trying to, you know, finish as strong as I can. And the last 500 meters or 400 meters, I had to pass somebody per second. And it's like, you never want a marathon to come down to a sprint finish because you just want to be done, but you always have to give it everything you've got. Um, you and I were talking about, you know, the weather and what, what it was going to look like. Tell me, you know, how you battled through that. Everyone we've been talking to has said, you know, it's pretty hot out there. How do you battle through those conditions? Yeah, I mean, I just try to mitigate as much as possible. So find the shade on the road. I take all the towels. I go through all the misting stations. I dump water on my head whenever possible on my hands. So cool yourself. And I think the other thing that worked to my advantage is I really kept the first half on the conservative side. And in warm conditions, pacing is key. And I think I mentioned that the other day is you just have to go out slower. And if people go out too fast, they won't maintain the pace that they go out on. And, and it's a race where, you know, the more evenly you can run, the better. How are you going to celebrate this? Do you have any, any, any plans? Well, my four-year-old is here today with my husband, so we'll go get some ice cream. And uh, my husband's sister, Elaine, and Michael, her husband, are here in Ottawa, and we don't see them very often, so it'll be great to see them. And then we get to go home tomorrow, and I get to see my other kiddo, and then, you know, it's right back into soccer, piano, homework. <laughs> Any other runs coming up for you? Yeah, we're going to have to see. Um, I'm on the team for Budapest in uh, at World Champs in August. Um, so that quite likely would be the next next thing I would target. Uh, it's only 12 weeks away, so it comes pretty quick. Did you set a goal for yourself? And if so, have you achieved that goal? Did you surpass it? I did want to run the Olympic standard today, which was 226.50. But again, knowing the conditions, uh, 220, a minute off of that, in this condition, in these conditions on a pretty challenging rolly course with a lot of turns is a really strong run. So, uh, you know, you just got to take, take it when it comes. Well, congratulations. So proud of you here in Canada. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. All right, there you have it. Melinda Elmore, second place. And of course, your top Canadian. Back to you, Arash. A lot of turns, a lot of hills. But the ice cream payoff awaits for the Elmore family. <laughs> congratulations to the to the silver medalist. Um, it was it, it was going to be really difficult for her to set that Olympic standard today, wasn't it? And, and she knew that going into it. There's yeah. only so many race opportunities. We know that she went to Seville earlier this spring and it didn't work out for her, so this was kind of plan B. She was in great fitness. I, I had been tracking that. Uh, but she was realistic. She was wise about her pacing. She said she went conservative in the first half. And... Um, you know, she did everything she could in that sprint finish to get the second place. Like, she's not going to be disappointed when she goes to, to bed tonight. Oh, she, she ran brilliantly today in really difficult circumstances. I think that's a marvellous performance, and it bodes well for Budapest. As she said, it's only 12 weeks away. Uh, we have 30 seconds. You have something coming up, Rob. I do. 
A week tomorrow, I start a 1,000-mile-plus journey of cycling and running from the very top of Britain, John O'Groats, to the very bottom Land's End. I'm raising money for two charities. One is the Brain Tumor Charity, and the other is a tiny little hospice near where I live that delivers end-of-life care for children so that they can pass away at home. Three really good friends of mine died in a short space of time. I did eulogies for all of them, and then very sadly, one of my son's best friends died at the age of nine, so I wanted to do something to honour them and celebrate their lives rather than just mourn them. It's been a lot of fun. Great cause. Thank you for watching, everybody. What a day, what a race, what a 2023 Ottawa International Marathon it was. a number of local charities. Hi guys, my name is Bai and I'm a part of Encore Ottawa 3. Uh, my set at the Meridian Theatre is coming out this week and I hope you tune in. It's been two years later. This is Rogers TV Ottawa. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details.